Bullied for being weak, he is trained by demons and becomes overpowered. The anim kicks off with a guy named Shinsu Kyudu gearing up to take on three thugs when he realizes they're talking to others. The girl urges the trio to quit their thug life and get a real job, but the guys mock her, demanding her and her brother's belongings. So the guy nails one of them with his stick, taking off the three. Then he scatters some papers on the ground, activating magic that makes three giant hands rise and punch each of the thugs. The guy enjoys how he sent them flying, but his sister isn't amused and scolds him for taking down the thieves. They needed to find their leader, but the guy says the thugs are unlikely to spill that info. Since questioning the guys is now out of the picture, they decide to leave. Shinsuke watches them from afar, intrigued to know more about them, impressed by the guy's technique. The girl hears Shinsuke in the bushes but keeps quiet, continuing on her way. Some time later, they stop by a stream to drink water and eat. However, the girl is fed up with being observed and throws a stone at Shinsuke. After getting hit, he leaves his hiding spot and introduces himself, explaining he's a warrior on a training journey. The girl asks why he's following them, and Shinsuke explains that he saw how they dealt with the thugs and wants to know the brother's technique. Still, the guy refuses to spill the beans. They continue on their way, but Shinsuke says he knows where the bandit leader is and proposes a deal. They explain their technique, and he'll reveal the leader's location. The guy agrees, introducing himself as Jinka, a Sendu monk, and his sister, a fox yukai named Tama. They're sworn siblings, and the technique involves talismans infused with spiritual power. Shinsu laughs at them, but Tama terrifies him with a snake, threatening to throw it unless he shows the way to the bandit leader. Quickly, Shinsu agrees to guide them, and Tama puts the snake on the ground, transforming it into a branch. Some time later, the three reach the place where the bandits gather, and Shinsu explains they are the Overhelmet Gang, a notorious criminal faction in the region. He reveals their leader is a helmeted guy. Rumored to have the strength of an ogre or even hidden horns. Tama Novus's Shinsuke knows a lot about the gang, and Jinka guesses he aims to gain fame by hunting and capturing criminals. Shinsuke says it's a good plan to help him train and questions them, mocking him for it when they seem to do the same. However, Tama clarifies that she and her brother have a goal, refusing to reveal it to someone who trembles in fear over a simple snake, taunting Shinsuke. The warrior gets irritated, claiming his fear of snakes is an exception and could easily take down the bandit leader if he wanted. However, Shinsuke ends up shouting so loudly that all gang members hear his threat. Right away, the three find themselves surrounded by bandits, but the brothers don't mind as they didn't intend to stay hidden forever. Tama reminds Jinka that their goal is to teach the thieves a lesson. So they approach the leader and Tama states that they come to say that what they're doing is wrong. She tells the bandits to stop committing crimes, but everyone laughs at the girl. Jinka gets ready to act, but she signals him to wait. She begins to give a speech about how the bandits will regret their actions in the future, urging them to change their lives and create a world of charity and cooperation for a peaceful life. After finishing, Tama acts as if she delivered a brilliant speech and Shinsu can't believe she sought out the leader just to say those things. The gang tries to attack the girl, but Jinka protects her, stating that humans aren't worth all the effort. However, Tama tells him to stop being so short-tempered. Next, the leader orders his gang to attack. In an instant, the girl leaps out of the way so her brother can handle the bandits, leaving Shinsuke once again impressed with both of them. After all, nobody dared to mess with that gang while they handled it calmly. At that moment, one of the guys tries to attack him, leaving the boy terrified. Despite the fear, he manages to strike the bandit with his sword, splitting his helmet in half. This boosts Shinsuke's confidence to face the leader. He draws his sword and makes his move, but suddenly two hands emerge from the helmet, grabbing the warrior's weapon and tossing him aside. A grumpy face emerges from the helmet, complaining about having to appear, terrifying the bandits. The monster makes it clear that it will kill anyone trying to escape. Tama recognizes it as a Katawara, a term encompassing supernatural creatures, ghosts, and other inhuman entities. Jacob deduces it's a strong one, having stayed hidden for quite some time. He contemplates defeating it with transfiguration, although admitting he'll feel guilty for being a Katawara. Tama doesn't care if it's human or Katawara, as long as those persisting in villainy are punished. The creature tries to attack, but they easily evade, and Tama releases a liquid on her hand, causing her brother to transform using transfiguration. It's a technique where the user harmonizes with the spirit of a Katawara, transforming partially into it. Jacob becomes much stronger in his spiritual form. The Katawara orders the gang to attack, but Jinka effortlessly deals with the bandits and faces the monster using only his staff, impressing Shinsuke once again. Jinka approaches the Katawara and attacks, but its hands hold the staff just like they did with Shinsuke's sword. It prepares to strike with its other pair of hands. However, the monk uses his strength and manages to execute his move, toppling the Katawara and splitting the helmet in half. 
This frees the soul of the man the monster was using, allowing it to move on to the afterlife. Shinsuke asks again about the brother's objective. Tama explains that she likes humans and has become accustomed to eliminating those dedicated to evil, while Jinka says he just goes along with her. Tama declares that they are the siblings of world renewal. Later, they continue on their way and Shinsu follows them. Thinking he never imagined that Katawara has existed, feeling as if he has just discovered a new and amazing world. At this moment, he notices the two entering a house and deduces that they intend to spend the night there. Later, inside the place, a guy warns everyone to stay away from a road because he encountered a monster there in the afternoon. He recounts that Saren, a monk of the Danyashu, tried to defeat Katawara, which he called Shakabian, the man devourer, but the monk lost the fight. The man sketches the monster and one of the Dangishu recognizes Shakugan. Everyone gets upset because he killed Saren, and they inform that the monks of the Dangishu order will handle the case, and no one else should interfere. Shinsuke observes the conversation and warns Jinka that they might try to exterminate Tama if they find out she is a fox yukai, but Jinka says they already know. Tama explains that Dangishu is an order of warrior monks that cultivate spiritual power to confront Katawaras, and they don't kill without reason, only pursuing those who pose a threat to humans. Shinsuke notes that they both understand the matter well, and Tama explains that they have been in this life for a long time. She asks where the boy intends to go for his training, to find out if he is not interested in helping them in the world's renewal. Shinsuke declines the invitation, pretending he wasn't following them, saying they went the same way only by coincidence, and he will spend the night with them just because it got late. Jinka shows impatience with the warrior, but Tama observes that Shinsu showed determination when he tried to attack the Katawara from the gang. In the middle of the night, Shinsu gets up to train a bit because he wanted to get stronger. He was the son of a samurai, but when he was young, he was mocked by other children for being weak. Now his sword strike made the Katawara reveal itself, making Shinsu wonder if he could defeat such monsters. The warrior thinks he can follow his path with the Dangeshu or with the two brothers to become stronger and capable of defeating monsters. At that moment, Tama appears, guessing his thoughts, and throws him into the water. Jika also appears and explains that his sister was worried that Shinsuke had gone out in the middle of the night to try to steal from someone. She admits that she worried for nothing, but Jinka didn't care because for him, it was just a great opportunity to mess with a human. Jinka leaves Shinsu trembling with fear. But Tama reprimands her brother's behavior and explains to the warrior that that's just how he is. In the middle of the conversation, the girl feels sleepy and goes to sleep, acting like a child, making Shinsu think he would learn more by staying with the Dangishu. The next day, the warrior wakes up and realizes that everyone else had already gotten up and gone after Katawara, which they call Shakugan. So he hurries to catch up with the group because he wanted to witness another battle against a monster. He manages to catch up with everyone but realizes that the situation is a bit tense. He decides it's better to hide and observe from a distance. One of the Dangishu tells Jinka to stay out of worldly matters because they should be resolved by humans. Still, he responds that since the monks intend to harm a Katawara, a good reason must be presented. Another Dangishu replies that it's obvious that a Katawara that harms people is evil, but Jinka says that if they are going to analyze the story only based on that, then humans are the villains. Tama catches her brother's attention again and asks the Dangishu why Shakugan is hurting humans, but they refuse to answer, saying the temple instructed them not to discuss the matter. Jacob becomes irritated with so much secrecy, and Shinsuke observes that the boy truly hates humans, unlike his sister, who likes them and wants to make the world a better place. Suddenly, Shakugan appears behind Shinsuke, and the boy is startled to see how large the monster is. One of the Dangishu pulls the warrior out of the way for the others to attack, and Jinka becomes annoyed to see that Shinsuke was spying on them once again. Next, the Dangeshu attempt to restrain Shakugan with their spiritual power. While Shinsuke is impressed, Jinka is relieved to know that they won't be able to defeat Katawara with just that power. Shakugan manages to break free, leaving Jinka excited. However, Tama instructs her brother to help the Dangeshu. The boy dislikes the idea of helping humans but obeys the girl's request and confronts the monster with his staff. Shinsuke is impressed with his power and Tama asks if the warrior still wants to get involved with them because they live in that world of darkness. This only makes Shinsuke more excited because he knew he could become stronger alongside them. Jika continues to face Shakugan, using talismans infused with his spiritual power, creating several hands that strike the monster. However, when he was about to defeat Katawara, the boy notices something on Shakugan that captures his attention. The monster tries to attack Jinka. The boy swiftly dodges the blow and then rushes away with both Dengai shoes to get out of there. Shinsuke is frozen with fear and almost gets left behind, but in the end, they all manage to escape while Jinka's giant hands hold on the Shakugan. 
Now in safety, Shinsuke remarks that he's impressed by Jinka's fast running, especially while carrying the two monks. Tama explains that it's thanks to the training his brother received from someone named Kokugetsusai and the Dange Shu recognized the name of the monk Sendo, being impressed to learn that the boy is his apprentice. One of them with an X-shaped scar on his forehead named Inga, mentions that Kokugetsusai has defeated countless sorcerers and evil spirits. Rumors have it that no human or Katawara has faced him and survived, earning him the title of the Phoenix Slayer. The man asks how Jinka managed to be trained by such a legend, and the boy explains that Kakubetsusei raised him from a young age, so he didn't have to do much to learn from him. Next, Kama makes it clear to the monks that they would be dead if not for her brother, and as a way to repay the favor, they must tell everything they know about the Katawara they call Shakugan. They agree, but Inga warns that they'll regret attacking the creature once they know the truth. He explains that Shakugan is a human spiritually modified, and Shakugan is her real name. His partner, Ohau, continues explaining that the Dang Ishu are trying to turn humans into Katawaras to reinforce their military power, and the girl is an experimental super soldier created by the main temple of the Dang Ishu. Tama asks how she turned into a monster, and Ohau explains that they recruited peasants with spiritual potential for experiments. Shakigan among them went out of control during the procedure and escaped. He tells that after her escape, she returned to her village and killed all the residents probably out of resentment for the discrimination and mistreatment she suffered for having spiritual energy. Inga explains that Shakuman left the bodies so disfigured that it was impossible to identify the dead, and she likely continues to roam the region in search of other survivors. After hearing the whole story, Shinsuke is furious with how the samurais and monks treat peasants like trash and treat the lives of the weak as if they have no value, needing to be strong and important to be valued. Hohao says it was never their intention for things to end up that way, thinking they were helping her as she was mistreated by the villagers. This only angers Shinsuke even more, questioning how the Dangishu thought turning Shakugan into a monster was helping her. The monk explains that they intended to make her a member of the monastery, but after she fled, she eliminated her village and the Dangishu they sent after her. Therefore, she stopped being a victim, and her goal changed to eliminating Shakugan. Shinsuke starts yelling at them again, but Tama kicks him and says it's a job for the Brothers of World Renewal. The man starts saying they shouldn't get involved as it's a dang issue matter, but the girl questions if they can handle Shakugan. Inga admits they need reinforcements to deal with the problem and accepts the help of the brothers. Then Shinsuke asks if Jinko will let others decide for him. The boy responds that he doesn't mind and will try to solve the problem with a good hit. And so they go outside and the two brothers use the transfiguration technique. Tama makes her hand bleed and after Jinka ingests a drop and harmonizes his spirit with his sister's powers, he partially transforms into a fox yukai, while the girl's hair turns black. Inga immediately recognizes Kokugetsusei's secret technique, remembering reading about transfiguration, but comments that, at best, Jinko will only be able to fight on equal terms with a modified human. Suddenly, Shakugan appears, and they realize the creature followed them there. Jinka prepares to fight, and then starts hitting the Katawara with his staff repeatedly, although he's clearly holding back. The monks observe that Jinka isn't giving his all, and knowing Shakugan is quite resilient, they think it might not end well for the boy. At that moment, the Katawara lands a blow on Jinka and prepares to launch a powerful attack, a Dangishu secret technique called the Roar of Celestial Tremor. The monks are worried about the boy while Tamar remains confident that the attack won't even tickle her brother. Jinka sees the attack approaching and uses the giant hand technique called the Earthly Fist of the Monarch to break the attack and hit right in the middle of the Katawara. And so, the creature shatters into a thousand pieces, making the boy think he went overboard. However, thanks to the attack, Shakugan manages to return to being human. They run to see the unconscious girl, but the two monks tell the kids to step back, saying she's under the custody of the Dangeshu. Shinsuke immediately prepares to fight, but Inga decides it's best to leave since he wasn't willing to face Jinka's powers. And so, after Uhu agrees and they begin to leave, the boy releases his power, returning him and his sister to normal. However, Tama calls the monks to say that all the culprits deserve punishment. She asks the two to show them where the main temple of the Dangishu is, the place that conducted experiments with humans, so they can pay, surprising the monks. Inga explains that they have over 300 monks inside the temple, thinking that this would make the brothers give up. However, Shinka is pleased with the idea of beating up 300 monks at once. Realizing they wouldn't change their minds, Inga instructs the two to ask Shakugan for the location but makes it clear that when the time comes, the Dangeshu will confront them with full force. And so the monks leave, and Shinsuke thinks that Tama and Jinka must be crazy to want to face all the Dangeshu in the temple alone. After some time, Shakugan finally wakes up. Tama and Shinsuke ask how she's feeling and the girl is confused about what's happening, asking if the spiritual surgery is over. 
They introduce themselves, and since she doesn't remember anything, Jinka asks her to recount the last thing she remembers. Shaka then recounts that she had just harvested some vegetables when she returned to her village and saw her father talking to a monk. He was happy, holding a good amount of money, barely looking at her before leaving her alone with the monk. The man says he knows she wants to belong somewhere since she's mistreated by everyone in the village, and he has what she wants. After that, the monk took her to the mountains, promising everything would be resolved when she woke up and put her to sleep. That's the last thing she remembers. Shinsu gets furious with the monks again, and Shakugan asks what she's doing in that place. Jinka explains that after the operation, she went out of control and escaped from the Dangeshu temple. Shinsu complains about the boy's honesty, and Tama quickly invents that she doesn't remember anything due to a fever, wandering in the mountains for a few days. Then the girl apologizes for causing them trouble. Later, Shinsu goes to cut some wood, paying for their stay, using the task to vent all the anger he feels towards the Dangeshu for what they did to the girl without caring. In a flashback, it's shown when Shakyamin returned to her village as a monster and lost control when she saw everyone who made her suffer, including her own father, who still had the money he received from the monk. Back to the present, Shinsu continues cutting wood until Tama appears asking where his brother is because everything is ready for them to go to the main temple of the Dangeshu. Shinsuke explains that he hasn't seen Jinka and wonders how the monks managed to turn a human into Katawara, but Tama simply replies that she has no idea how they did it. The lady hosting the four finds the girl cute and asks her age. Tama answers that she's around 200 and something years old, but the lady finds it amusing, thinking it's just a child's joke. Later, Shinsu goes to look for Jinka and finds him calmly near a cliff. He explains that everything is ready for them to leave and the boy thanks him saying that Shinsuke is a good employee, which annoys him since he was just doing him a favor. And so the group heads towards the main temple of the Danga Shu, with Shinsuke eager to make the monks pay for making Shakugan suffer and eliminating everyone in his village, although he recognizes he's far from being strong enough to face all of them. Then Shinsuke asks Jinka if he really intends to face the Danga Shu for what they did to Shakugan, considering she's a human he hates so much. The boy clarifies that his reason is different because the Dangeshu were humans hunting Katawara and he sees the group as a bunch of vermin that needs to be exterminated. This scares Shinsuk and Jinka notices the fear in his eyes. Shinsuk tries to deny and act brave, saying he's not afraid of a kid like him. Then Shinsuk says he'll accompany the two until he becomes strong enough, but Jinka tells him that if something happens to him, it's not their problem. After walking for a while, the four reach the valley where, according to Shakugan, the main temple is right in the middle, making it easy to locate. Tama climbs onto Shinsu's head to get better view and asks Shakugan if that's where her operation took place. She agrees and Jinka thinks that to reach the temple, they have to cross the gates and go through the building to the inner area. His sister reminds them that their goal is just to scare the monks into stopping the experiments, believing not all of them are wrongdoers. Next, the girl asks Shakugan and Shinsu to stay with her, watching the situation from the top of a mountain while Jinka takes care of everything. Her brother warns that the situation might take longer than usual, making her a bit sad. And so after the two activate the transfiguration technique again, the siblings split up and Tama goes with the others to the top of a mountain, while Jinka heads to the temple. Upon arriving, he's excited about the idea of breaking down the temple gates, but to his surprise, the Dangeshu open the doors showing they're prepared to face him, thanks to Inga, who was waiting for his arrival. The monk assures Jinka he'll have an extraordinary funeral, and orders the others to attack. The boy thanks them for the welcome, eager to face so many humans at once. Then, everyone strikes him in various parts of his body, but the Dangeshu soon realize it was just a Shikigami and he was actually on the roof. At that moment, Jinka prepares to use the monarch's earthly fist on them while, nearby, Shakugan, Shinsuke, and his sister strain to see the fight from the top of the mountain. Jinka continues attacking the monks when Inga suddenly shoots his leg with a shotgun. The boy remains firm and beats the Dangeshu, giving them a beating with his staff. However, when he's about to attack Inga, Jinka realizes the monks are about to use their secret technique, the roar of the celestial tremor. After the attack, Shinsu becomes concerned about Jinka due to the magnitude of the explosion caused by the secret technique of the Dangeshu. Inga thinks he has defeated the boy, but then Jinka attacks him and the other monks with fury, making him realize that the boy lives up to his master, even though he knows that Jinka's spiritual energy won't last forever. Some time later, Tama observes that the fighting has stopped and deduces that her brother has managed to win and proceed on the path to the temple castle, where the Dangeshu conduct experiments on humans. At that moment, Shinsuke notices that despite the girl being a Katawara in human form, she still has fox ears. 
Tama then reveals that she also has human ears and explains that the fox ears are to remind her of who she truly is and are also useful for good hearing. Shinsuke asks if Tama would cease to be a Kadawara if she forgets who she is, but the fox explains that it wouldn't change her nature, and that she simply likes to keep her ears during transfiguration out of habit. Then Shinsuke asks if Jinka can maintain his Kadawara form by using the transfiguration technique for a long time, and Tama explains that the technique ends shortly before permanent transformation, so he couldn't remain as a Kadawara forever. Meanwhile, in the temple forest, Jinka is observed by the Dange Shu and their leader, Yezin, who is disappointed with his monks for allowing a simple boy to do as he pleases. The leader decides that the best course of action is to move the laboratory to a place where they won't be bothered. At the same time, Jinka observes Yezin talking and suspects that he is the boss. Next, the leader assigns one of the monks to deal with Jinka. The man faces the boy alone, confident that he will win and make him regret messing with the Dange Shu. The monk transforms into a creature and Jinka deduces that he is one of the enhanced humans who underwent the experiment. The creature advances and grabs the boy, but Jinka easily turns the tables, crushing him with a technique called the flail of the ancient tree. Then Inga appears and notices that the boy is getting tired of using so many attacks. He asks Jinka about his goal in confronting the Dangishu, pointing out that even if he defeats the monks, he will be hunted for the rest of his life. Ignoring Inga, Jinka understands that the man was just trying to buy time until reinforcements arrive. As a reward for Inga challenging him so much, Jinka decides to answer his question and reveal what he's seeking. Jinka explains that his goal is to steal all the Dangishu's research material to perfect his master's transfiguration technique. His dream is to rid himself of his human part and become a true and complete Katawara. After explaining his objective, Jinka continues on his path, leaving Inga surprised by his goal. The monk observes that despite being a human traveling with a fox yukai, the boy is more demonic than her. Shinka moves forward until he reaches the castle that Shakugan explained is where the experiments take place. However, he doesn't know how much longer his spiritual strength will be able to sustain transfiguration. Excited to fulfill his goal and destroy the facility, Shinka attacks when suddenly the castle moves and a giant hand hits him, sending him flying. At that moment, Tama returns to normal and realizes that her brother's transfiguration has unraveled, meaning he is either conscious or dead. Everyone worries about Jinka when suddenly one of the Dangi Shu appears on Inga's orders, instructing him to capture Shakugan alive or dead and eliminate the other two. The monk transforms into a creature and Tama comments that he is one of the enhanced humans. This triggers Shakugan's memories of when she was in her monster form. Shinsu pretends they are just travelers who know nothing about the Dangi Shu or their experiments. He begs the monk to spare their lives, but it's evident he is lying since he referred to a monster as a monk. Despite his fear of being attacked, Shinsu continues to plead for his life, having the creature to delay him as much as possible so that Tama and Shakugan can seize the opportunity to escape. He is determined to be stronger and not flee like a coward. However, when the monster is about to attack, Shakugan transforms her arm into a Katawara, sending the creature flying, saving Shinsu and rendering the opponent unconscious. She explains that she remembered everything she had forgotten, recalling when she attacked all the people in her village including children and her own father. Haunted by these memories, Shakugan begins to feel like a monster and runs away from the two. Shinsu tries to follow, but Tama advises him to let her go, as the memories of the terror and suffering she caused are currently controlling her mind. Ignoring the fox's advice, he goes after Shakugan. This reminds Tama of when she lost a man named Genzo, who was very important to her. When he was almost lifeless, he handed her a letter to deliver to Kokogetsusai, the monk who trained Jinka, and then passed away, even though the girl pleaded for him not to leave. In a flashback, we see Jinka as a child. He was with the Katawara, and the two were heading towards a mountain, but on the way, they come across several humans warring among themselves. Because of this, the Katawara decided it was better for them to return to Master Kokogetsusai. Upon witnessing the war, Jinka was filled with questions that his friend couldn't answer, such as which side would win or how many would survive the battle. He also asked why humans were fighting and the Katawara responded that he believed it was something inherent in human life. During the journey back, they encounter a monster feeding on the bodies eliminated in the war. The Katawara hides Jinka with his hand and turns back, but at that moment, some humans spot the monsters and start a hunt. The Katawara tries to escape, but realizing he was getting surrounded, he hides Jinka in some bushes and instructs him to stay hidden until everything becomes silent. Jinka obeys his friend, but when it's all over, he comes out of hiding and finds Katawara's lifeless body riddled with arrows, marking the beginning of Jinka's hatred for humans. Next, the boy notices a wounded man nearby who is still trying to eliminate monsters. So Jinka grabs a sword from the ground and ends the man's life. 
Back in the present, Jinka wakes up startled because he had dreamed about his past about losing his friend to humans. Suddenly, he hears Yezin's voice communicating with him through a fabric shikigami. Yezin comments on Jinka's survival after the blow from Tazen, the main temple castle of the Dangishu which sent him flying. Yezin then introduces himself to Jinka as the leader of the monks and mentions that he'll have to send assassins after him to silence him since he knows too much. Jinka mocks Yezin, thinking that no one can defeat him but Yezin ignores him and asks about Kokogetsuze. Jinka replies that his master has passed away. Yezin says that's all he needs to know and bids farewell, dissolving the fabric Shikigami. Meanwhile, Shinsuke searches for Shakugan in the forest. He was already tired from running but refuses to give up on finding his friend. Suddenly, he stumbles on a tree branch and rolls to the edge of a cliff, where coincidentally the girl was reflecting on her actions. As soon as Shakyavin sees Shinsuke, she starts running but before disappearing again, he questions why she is running away. She explains that she wants to be alone since she is a monster and a killer who has hurt many people. Shinsuke tries to tell Shakyavin that she didn't do it willingly, as she was used by the monks. However, the girl says that even though her father indeed sold her to the Dangishu, she also bears responsibility for what happened because she willingly underwent the experiment when they offered power to her. Shinsuke questions what's wrong with wanting power, but at that moment, the ground beneath him gives way, leaving him hanging on the cliff. The girl gets worried, but when she sees he's okay, she takes the opportunity to escape. Shinsuke tries to climb alone to go after her, but ends up falling. Fortunately, a tree cushions his fall, bringing him safely to the ground. Then Tama appears, and before Shinsuke resumes searching for Shakugan, she asks why he is so determined to find the girl. Shinsuke explains that he doesn't really have a reason and simply feels that he shouldn't leave Shakugan alone at that moment. He believes that she and Njingo will never understand how humans truly feel. He turns to continue in his search, but Tama throws a stick at his head to indicate that he's going in the wrong direction. And so the two go together to find Shakugan. At the same time, Jinka thinks that it's time to join his sister. He walks through the forest to reach her when he finds some arrows in a tree, reminding him of the horrible dream he had. This makes Jinka think that if he were as strong as he is now, he could have saved his friend. But then he realizes that he shouldn't dwell on that and should be grateful for acquiring the power that prepared him to show humans the depth of darkness. Suddenly, his thoughts are interrupted by Shakugan, who appears running in the forest. He is surprised that her arm is in Katawara form and she's happy to see that the boy is alive. Then Shinsuke appears and jumps on the girl. Tama arrives right behind him and is happy to see her brother, who was confused and didn't understand what was happening. Shakugan tries to escape Shinsuke's embrace, but he continues to hold her. He tells her she can't run away from herself and that she's not a monster but human. Afterward, he says that weak people have no choice and can't overcome oppression, so it's natural to desire strength and power. Then Shinsuke starts crying and asks why Shakugan isn't happy now that she has the power. She doesn't understand his sadness, and they both start crying together. Tama and Jinka observe them and are reminded again of their losses. Then the fox tells her brother that, just as there are kind and cruel Katawaras, there are also humans of both types. She also reminds him that he himself is human and should overcome his hatred for his kind, no matter how long it takes. Afterward, Tama asks Shakugan to join them. Jinka questions her decision as he knew assassins would come after them, and he thought it would be safer to keep Shinsuke and Shakugan away from that situation. But Tama disagrees, stating that in their group, there's a Katawara, a human, and something in between, and that he has the power to protect all three. This way, he could learn from them how to live his life. And so, in times of war between humans and Katawara, monsters devour people while being hunted by them simultaneously, and a small group, humans and Katawaras, walk hand in hand. Afterward, the gang heads to the house of Jinka's master, Kokugetsusai, where the boy was raised and lived alone for some time after the monk's death until he reunited with his sister. There, Shinsu trains with Jinka, and unsurprisingly, the guy gets a beating. Meanwhile, Tama prepares an outfit for Shakugan to avoid any issues when transforming her arms into Katawara. Jinka wonders if he'll ever feel at ease in that house when a creature appears to greet him and Tama. The monster explains that it came to warn them about a Katawara demanding a sacrifice from a village, even though it provides no protection to the villagers, a task for the siblings of world renewal, as Tama and Jinka are called. And so the two set out to investigate the village's situation, and the fox leaves some tasks for Shinsuke and Shakugan to do until their return. However, the girl goes out to gather some vegetables, leaving all the heavy lifting for Shinsuke. In the village, Tama and her brother discover that the villagers refer to the sacrifice in Katawara as the Great Garagura, and the fox assures the villagers that they can handle the problem for them. Initially, the people refuse help, thinking the siblings are seeking payment for their service, 
but Tama explains that they have no interest in money and only wish to be treated kindly and helped by the locals at least once, so they can repay the favor by helping others in turn. All the villagers see Tama as crazy, but she is proud of her motivational speech, thinking that they will become kinder thanks to her help. Then a village boy guides the two siblings to the Katawara, and along the way, Tama continues to believe that she will create a wave of kindness with her work. Jika then remarks that renewing the world with that tactic might take a thousand years, but his sister remains undeterred because to her, if the world is better after a thousand years, she will have fulfilled her duty. Jika wonders how long they will be the world renewal siblings traveling the world fighting evil when the boy guiding them named Mokichi stops in the middle of the road to complain about the delay in help because his mother was devoured by the great Garagura the day before. He is furious that the two did not arrive sooner and expresses hope that they too will be devoured by the monster. Jika thinks about how humans only care about themselves and do not deserve his sister's love. However, the fox is also angry with the boy and rebukes him, saying that if he wants perfect help, he must find a way to become a flawless savior himself. After yelling and scolding the boy for his attitude, the three finally reach the place where the Katawara lives. Tema asks the great Garagura why it demands sacrifices from the village, and the monster explains that it's its payment for not destroying the place. The fox comments that this is unjust and gives three options to the great Garagura. Repent for its misdeeds and ask for forgiveness or take a beating, and then ask for forgiveness or die from a beating. However, the creature ignores the fox's words and launches an attack on the three. Jinka quickly lifts Tama and the boy into the air to protect them from the strike. He says that despite hating to face Katawaras, he cannot ignore the fact that it tried to harm his sister and promises to make the monster pay. The great Garagura becomes afraid of the boy and immediately takes a woman out of his belly who hadn't been digested yet to have a hostage to protect himself from Jinka. The boy contemplates taking action before his sister says anything, but at that moment, Mokichi starts begging the monster not to harm his mother and to use him as a hostage instead. So Tama lets Jinka decide how to proceed. He thinks his choice is obviously to ignore the hostage, since he didn't care about humans. However, he can't ignore the child crying for his mother. Suddenly, a man appears and swiftly eliminates the great Garagura. He calls Jinka a disciple of Kokogetsusai, the Phoenix Slayer, as his master used to be called, showing that he knows the boy. And so, while Mokichi reunites with his mother, Jinka and Tama discover that the man who eliminated Katawara is one of the assassins the Dangi Shu said they would send after them. The man comments that he's a bit disappointed with Jinka because the monks said he's a monster in human skin, unable to see the boy in that way. Then he takes Mokichi and his mother hostage to force Jinka into a duel, preventing the siblings from escaping. Jinka thinks he doesn't care at all about what happens to humans, but for some reason, he can't ignore the hostages. Because of this, Jinka and the man go to a rock-free area for their duel, where Tama instructs him to introduce himself. The man says his name is Zanzu Redu and that he's one of the Dark Eaters. He explains that the Dangishu sends him after a Katawara, and he eliminates them, selling the pieces to people who consume monster flesh, which he sees as normal since Katawara feed on humans, creating a two-way street. The siblings are taken aback as they didn't know there were people who consume creatures, and Jinka is furious that the Katawara, which he venerates, are chewed by human teeth, dishonoring their bodies. Then Jinka introduces himself to Radu as a monster, and they begin to fight. Jinka confronts his opponent of the technique called Flame Princess's Roar, the man uses his sorcerer's sword to block the attack and then launches a strike, making Jinka use the earthly monarch's fist to protect himself. The boy notices that Reidu's sword has great spiritual power. He then attacks with his techniques called Ancient Tree's Scourge and Dragon's Water Wall. Tama watches the two fight alongside Mokichi and his mother and notes that the man forced his brother to use four of his main techniques. After a while, they become exhausted from fighting and Reidu admits he can't defeat Jinka with his sorcerer's sword. The boy asks if he's surrendering, but Radu explains he's just switching to a weapon that can defeat him. Jinka is puzzled because he doesn't sense any spiritual power from Radu's new sword and doesn't understand why Radu chose to fight with a normal weapon. Then the man advances toward him, dodging all the earthly monarch's fists, and attacks Jinka, who defends himself with his staff, growing increasingly irritated with the duel when suddenly his defense fails, and Radu manages to place the sword at his neck. Jinka thinks he's about to lose his life, but the man merely holsters his weapon, leaving the boy relieved to be alive. This causes the transfiguration to lose its effect, and he returns to his human form. Jinka then asks why Radu didn't kill him. The man explains that he doesn't seem appetizing, and it's not cool to eliminate prey if he's not going to feed on them. Therefore, the boy got lucky and will continue to live. Next, Radu asks the fox to knock some sense into his brother's head and gets ready to leave. 
Mokichi and his mother thank him for saving her when he defeated Katawara, but the man says they should thank Jinka, because if the boy hadn't fought, he would have devoured them both. Raidu then departs, and Mokichi's mother thanks Jinka and Tama for their help. The boy apologizes for wishing them harm, but Jinka simply walks away without a word, feeling he doesn't deserve gratitude since he did nothing and almost abandoned them. His sister explains that although he considered it, he didn't abandon them. However, his brother was only concerned about losing to a mere human. Later, Raidu feeds on the great Garagura, realizing its taste is only slightly better than its appearance, and certainly not something that can be sold. At this moment, one of the Dangishu questions why he didn't eliminate Jinka, even though he won the duel. The Dangishu reminds Raido that his sister's life is in their hands, and he must face the boy again and end his life. The next day, Shinsuk was sore from doing the activities alone. Tama wakes up and asks where her brother is, and Shakugan explains she saw him leaving early in the morning. Chika was alone, contemplating the previous day's fight. He spends a long time recalling how he lost to a human when he notices someone approaching. Before attacking, Jinka recognizes it's Shakugan, and she explains she came to invite him to lunch, but he tells her to go away, saying he's not hungry. Shakugan then mentions she heard about what happened and is glad Jinka survived the fight because as long as he's alive, good things will happen. Jinka asks what good things happened since she was exiled from her village, sold by her own father, and turned into a half Katawara. She explains that despite everything, she's happy to have met him, Tama, and Shinsuke. She insists Jinka join her for lunch when they see a monk delivering a challenge letter to the boy, explaining that Jinka will have to face Radu again, but this time their lives are at stake. If he tries to escape, the Yamato clan will be exterminated. Jinka says he doesn't care about what happens to the clan residents, and the monk finds it amusing that the boy, abandoned by the Yamato, chooses their fate. Later, Jinka and Shakugan return home and recount what happened. Shinsuke is furious and calls the Dangishu cowards, asking why they threaten the clan. Tame explains it's where Jinka's family lives. Then the boy reveals he has no relationship with his parents because his master adopted him right after he was born. His sister asks what he will decide, and Jinka explains that although he doesn't care about the fate of the Yamato clan, he can't accept being defeated by a human. And so Jinka decides to accept the challenge, despite fearing the outcome of the fight, understanding that he needs to find a way to win to survive. On the next day, Radu and Jinka are set to face each other again, with the whole group watching the fight alongside the Dangishu. However, as soon as the duel begins, the boy realizes he made the wrong decision. Despite managing to adjust his attacks according to his opponent, Radu goes beyond and surpasses him. In that moment, Jinka sees his entire life flash before his eyes, thinking this might be the end. However, this determination prompts him to find a way out. Jinka then employs his monarch's earthly fist technique to crush his opponent, disregarding the fact that he will suffer the attack along with Radu. The blow leaves both of them battered, breaking Radu's weapon, and the boy starts laughing. He claims that being brought to the brink of death awakened his true fighting spirit. However, unlike Jinka, Radu can barely stand after being crushed and admits defeat, making the boy release a sinister laugh for having defeated the human. Tama is relieved to see her brother emerge victorious, fearing the loss of another important person to her. As the transfiguration effect wears off, Radu prepares for his end, but Jinka tells him he's lucky and will keep on living, the same words the man said to him after defeating him in their last duel. Tama is proud of her brother's attitude, while Shakigan and Shinsuke are impressed by his fighting abilities. Tama explains that the three of them were cheering for Jinka and asks if having human comrades was really that bad. Meanwhile, Radu still can't stand and worries about what the Dangishu will do to his sister since he lost the fight. The monk who ordered the duel explains that he received a message from Radu's sister, stating that if he lost, she would be the next assassin. Radu is confused and the Dangishu clarify that his sister's life was never in their hands because none of them can match her. In reality, she is one of their four beast leaders. The monk advises Radu to forget about his sister, as she has forsaken humanity to become a demon of war. A few days later, Jinka and Tama follow Shinsu to the entrance of a cave and discover that he's taking a rice ball to Radu who, in exchange for food, was training Shinsu how to handle a sword. Radu calmly eats his meal while noticing that the guy has good vertical strikes, although he needs to improve his lateral ones. He then instructs Shinsu to relax his shoulders and pay attention to the sound the air makes, explaining that when he executes the correct strike, the sound will be different. With his advice, Shinsu manages to execute a correct lateral strike, while the two brothers watch from a hiding spot in a bush and Jinga, remarks that the guy deserves a beating for raiding their pantry. Jinka then calls out to Shinsuke, startling him since he hadn't noticed the presence of the boy and his sister, unlike Raido, who spotted them hiding. 
Shimsu quickly explains that Radu isn't a bad man, and as a result, the man is taken to Jinka's house so the group can tend to his fight wounds, where he takes the opportunity to explain why he ended up with the Danga Shu group. Radu explains that his clan doesn't have much political power, but they possess a lot of spiritual strength, which often embroils them in battles against the Katawaras, and as a result, they try not to attract attention. However, because he still needed to eat, he became a cum darkness, while his sister became a nun of the Dange Shu. Radio explains that she has average spiritual power compared to the other monks, and thus the leaders of the order could eliminate her at any time, which is why he obeyed the Dange Shu, although he discovered that in reality his sister, Hino, gained fame among the monks and became Hygen, one of the four beast leaders of the group and apparently the next assassin to go after Jinka. Then the boy explains that it was pure luck to have defeated Radu without delivering any fatal blows, and his sister might not have the same luck, but the man says that maybe she'll defeat him instead of the other way around. Meanwhile, Tama reflects that Hygen, the new name for Hino, means frozen rock, a name similar to Shakugan's, which makes her and Jinka suspicious that Radu's sister might be another person spiritually modified. Next, Shinsuke sees a creature resembling a tree trunk approaching the house and gets scared but then discovers that it's a friend of Jinka's. The creature is injured and explains that a woman appeared out of nowhere and chased him away, sending a warning that she's after the boy. Immediately, everyone suspects Hygen and Rado tries to go after his sister, but still being injured, he struggles to get up and Jinka apologizes, explaining that he'll have to eliminate her for injuring one of their mountain friends. So the boy leaves and Tama asks Shinsuke and Shakugan to stay in the house to take care of their friend while they're away, but Shakugan insists on going along and Shinsuke realizes he'll be alone with the creature. And thus, the whole group, except for Shinsuke, goes to where Hagen was spotted. The one is happy to see her brother, and they start talking, but Jinka interrupts them, eager to fight and make her pay for what she did to his friend. Tama notices how worked up the boy is and tells him to cool his head. Then the two activate their transformation and Jinka morphs. So Hagen also activates her Katawara form and introduces herself as one of the four beast leaders of the Dangeshu who is on a mission to defeat Jinka. She remarks that this will earn her entire clan, including her brother, a place among the monks making Radu realize that this is the reason she joined them. Jinka prepares to begin their fight when suddenly Shakugan recognizes Hagen, because when they were just Katawara and they were called Kagan and Soga, they used to be friends. This confirms Tamman's guess that modified humans are actually Katawaras sealed within the bodies of humans with spiritual power, the Kagan sealed within Shaku and Soga within Hino. At this moment, the woman corrects, saying that her name is now Hagen, and that neither the human nor the Katawara exist anymore. This makes Jinka even more irritated. Finding the human modification that the Dangishu do increasingly cruel, especially for playing with the lives of the Katawara. He tells Shakugan to step aside to let the two fight, but the girl says that Soba is a friend of Kagan's and therefore she cannot let him hurt her. Hagen realizes that this means the consciousness of Katawara has remained within Shakugan and calls the girl weak because of it, explaining next that her mission is to eliminate not only Jinka, but her as well. This angers Kagan, the Katawara within Shakugan, for Hagen treating the girl who accepted him into her body that way and questions if his friend Sobe is indeed her partner. Then Hagen reveals that she had already devoured the consciousness of the Katawara a long time ago because it was unnecessary. At that moment, Kagan becomes extremely angry and asks Jinka to leave that fight to him. The boy accepts his request, releasing his transformation and says he wants to be his friend. Then the Katawara explains that Shaku, and you're a single being that divides the body into two minds and as the girl considers him a friend, he also has the same consideration. Next, Shakugan attacks Hagen with all her might using a move called Celestial Tremor Roar. The woman is impressed with her ability but manages to resist easily and attacks her using the same technique, although much more powerful. Fortunately, Shakugan also resists and the two continue to fight bravely. Jinka observes that Shakugan coordinates the consciousness of the Katawara and the girl well and maintains the balance of her spiritual power, despite her opponent being at the same level as when he is transformed, which puts Shakugan at a slight disadvantage. Meanwhile, Shinsu feeds Jinka's friend with some worms, while noting that the creature is not as sinister as he initially thought. At this moment, the creature asks if he's a friend of Jinka's too, and Shinsu replies that he doesn't know if the boy considers him that way. Then the creature asks him to be patient with Jinka, because despite being stubborn, he takes good care of his friends. Shinsuke responds that he has already noticed that and then decides to leave to find more worms. However, as soon as he leaves the house, he suddenly feels cold and senses the presence of a little boy named Senya, next to his master, Junin. And looking into the boy's eyes, Shinsuke sees him in a river of blood. The two decide to leave and shortly after, the creature leaves the house commenting that he smelled a dragon. Then he shows a shortcut for Shinsu to reach Jinka, telling them to flee as far away as possible. 
And so Shinsuke arrives at the group where Shakugan and Hagen were already tired from so much fighting. Jika questions why the guy is there, thinking he abandoned his friend alone, but Shinsuke explains that the creature itself sent him to inform them that it sensed the smell of a dragon and that they should flee. Hagen immediately thinks of Master Jinin, while Jika becomes desperate and orders everyone to run. However, at that moment, the dragon finds them. Jinin states that he is there to execute Hagen, who was accused of killing a high-ranking official of the Shogunate. The woman questions if he has any proof and says she's in the middle of a mission, but Jinan says it's not his concern to worry about proof, only to administer justice. And so, in a matter of seconds, he transforms into a dragon and strikes Hagen with a fatal blow, without giving any of them time to react. Then, Jinan returns to his human form and addresses Jinka, recognizing the boy as the one responsible for attacking the main temple of the Dangishu. Quickly, Jinka grabs his sister and creates a smokescreen, telling everyone to take advantage of the moment to flee and regroup in the loser's cave. Then Jinka, transformed, Shinsuke, and Reido try to attack the dragon, but Senya protects his master with a Katawara arm delivering a fatal blow to the three. However, the boy soon realizes that attack was not real, but just a distraction for everyone to escape. Gradually, the group regroups in the loser's cave as Jinka instructed and Tama notices that her brother was quite frightened. Shakugan manages to bring Hino still alive thanks to her vitality being increased by the spiritual modification process, although she doesn't have much time left. Radio asks his sister if she really killed a Shogun official, and the woman explains that Lord Matsunaga ordered her to eliminate Lord Nagiyoshi Miyoshi, the Shogun's assistant. Radio doesn't understand why, since the Dangeshu are not allowed to use their powers to influence politics. Then Hino questions if only their clan is forbidden from having any kind of ambition just because they were born with spiritual power. She asks if their family doesn't deserve to be happy, considering their clan has been relegated to the underworld for years. The woman tells Radio that his talent with the sword can help the clan, wishing they achieve the fame they deserve. However, her brother responds that none of them ever wish for great ambitions like her and that no one needs fame or anything else to be happy. Then Hino mocks Radio and suddenly she grows and says she won't give up on freeing him from the darkness. Later, the woman says she knows she won't be accepted by the Dangeshu, but she's sure Lord Matsunaga will give her shelter and that, to survive, she only needs to feed on a Katawara. Then Hinema starts heading towards Tama, leaving Radu and Shakugan worried about the fox, but at that moment, Jinka attacks Hino to protect his sister. Radu watches the situation knowing that this is the end of the woman's life. He laments and says that it's not destiny that dictates their happiness, but their heart. Afterwards, Jinka prepares to end Hino's life, wishing her a safe journey to the other side. Before dying, the woman comments that she wished to be human, those being her last words. Shakigan then mourns the death of his friend, not understanding why Hino decided to join him if the two couldn't coexist. Tama tries to console her friend and then instructs her brother to confront Jinin because they couldn't keep running away from the dragon forever. Even if Jinka could handle all the other assassins, Jinin would still be after him. Due to this, the only option is to face him. Shinsuke asks if it's possible, and Tama says that to ensure Jinka isn't defeated, they need to take three steps to prepare. The first step is to find the Dangeshu laboratory and put an end to the cruel experiments with the Katawara once and for all. Next, they must steal the research results from the monks and gather information to help them defeat the dragon. Finally, they should use what they discover to escape, buying time to prepare for the inevitable encounter. These steps intertwine what they need to do to overcome the opponent with the mission of stopping the experiments. Shakigan then mentions that before doing all this, the Katawara inside her body wants to take her friend's remains back to their home. Despite not knowing the location, she can find it by the smell. Tama agrees to fulfill the Katawara's wish before starting the three planned steps. Reida wishes the group good luck and decides to stay to bury his sister. Tama remarks that the dragon, Junan, might be strong, but to her, he's just a pup half her age. They will escape as many times as necessary to ensure her brother can defeat him. After all, Jaina is just a master who loves preaching about justice but refuses to talk and abuses his strength. And so the four set off on their new journey. Shinsuke reflects that what began as a path for survival has turned into a profound contemplation of what defines humans and Katawaras. Before the group set off, Shinsuke received a weapon from Radio called the Arabuki Sorcerer's Sword, which has the power to control winds through spiritual abilities. The man explained that the weapon is passed down from generation to generation in his clan, but as he is now going to serve and protect the Shogun, Yashituru, and his family, so that his services pay for the actions his sister committed, he will give it to Shinsuke, because the boy will surely need the spiritual sword to face Lord Yoshitero, who is known for having a natural talent, just like a master swordsman. 
Later, Reidu asks Shinsu to teach the monk a lesson, so that he pays for what he did to his sister, and the boy accepts to do it for him after all, the man was asking for his help and giving him his spiritual sword as a gift. Back in the present, Shinsu feels great during the journey for having his spiritual weapon, but when he tries to wield the sword, he causes an explosion that throws him away. Jika explains that this is what happens when someone without spiritual power uses the sword and he was lucky not to be sliced or thrown into the clouds, which could very well have happened, making the guy stop feeling confident and return to feeling weak. After walking a lot, the group stops to rest, and while Tama sleeps on Shakugan's lap, the girl comments that she is excited about the trip, and that they are getting close to Kagan's house, the Katawara inside her body. However, Shinsuke and Jinka were not enjoying the journey like her, because they were not excited about the idea of being close to facing the Dragon Man, especially because Shinsuke still didn't know how to use his spiritual sword. Shakugan cheers up her friend saying that he will surely manage, but Jinka immediately says that his comment was without any basis. Shinsuke starts complaining that Jinka always discourages him when suddenly Tama wakes up smelling something with her fox-like sense of smell. She quickly runs in the direction of the smell, until she reaches a group of monkeys, who were carrying several barrels of sake, and starts negotiating her turnips for one of them, desperate to get some of the drink. The monkeys explain that they cannot give anything because the barrels belong to a guest, and that's why she must negotiate with him. So the group goes after this guest, and on the way they explain to Shinsuke that the monkeys are Katawara monkeys who love alcohol. Tama comments that Kagan must know about them, and then Katawara takes control of Shakugan's body, explaining that the girl doesn't mind him doing that, and says he is excited to try the legendary drink of the monkeys. After a while, the four arrive at the monkey's host, Doran Adangashu, who recognizes the group responsible for the attack on the main temple. The team gets into a defensive position when they realize that the man is one of the monks, but Doran introduces himself as the tiger, one of the four beast leaders of the Dangashu, but reassures them, explaining that he won't attack any of them after all, no one ordered it. Then Tama gets excited again and challenges Doran to a drinking contest, feeling confident because she knows they have an advantage, since the man had already drunk a lot and wouldn't be able to drink much longer. And so they begin the challenge, but Jinka proves to be extremely weak at drinking sake, getting knocked down at the first sip, while the other three get super excited drinking the legendary monkey drink. While they drink, Tama praises Doran for maintaining his composure after discovering that the group is responsible for the temple attack and asks what led a Dangishu like him to visit the monkey folks. The man agrees to tell how he came to that and begins to explain that he was sent by the monks to exterminate a Katawara tiger that was roaming the mountain. He says the beast proved to be very fierce, forcing him to flee through the forest, leading him to encounter the monkey folks who were trembling in fear of the tiger. Doran recounts that after that, he devised a strategy to use Sake as bait to attract the tiger. His plan left the tiger dizzy, but the animal still proved to be a strong opponent, and after a two-night battle, he was severely injured and the tiger sobered up again. The man explains that at that moment, he thought it was his end, but two of the monkeys gathered courage and hit the beast with one of the barrels, leaving the tiger dizzy again, creating the perfect opportunity for him to end that fight with a powerful blow, and that's when the friendship between him and the monkey folks emerged. After a long time of drinking, Doran, who loved to chat while having sakes, says the group can ask anything else they want to know because he will answer any questions. So Tama takes the opportunity to ask what Jinan, the Dragon Man's weakness, is, so they can find a way to defeat him. Doran jokes that he has a weakness for spicy food, but then tells the group not to waste time thinking about it, because he will be the one to defeat the Dragon Man, as they are old rivals from the same city. Doran explains that he became one of the Dangishu following in Jinan's footsteps, dedicating his entire life to surpassing him in martial arts, and that's why he is the only one who can defeat him. With this, Tama deduces that Doran is also one of the spiritually modified humans who have a Katawara inside their bodies. The man refuses to answer, explaining that he wants to leave that mystery, and then praises the fox's resistance to alcohol, making her remember the first time she tasted sake with her old friend Genzo, who died from an illness. Then, they refocus on the challenge and start laughing, each thinking they will be the one to win. However, at night, Tama can't hold on and falls asleep, as well as Shinsuke, leaving only Shakugan and Doran standing. But he was already getting dizzy and couldn't drink anymore, while the Katawara remained lively with the drink and showed no sign of wanting to stop. And so, the next day, everyone wakes up with a hangover, except for Shakugan and Jinka, because she proved strong with alcohol while he only took a sip. The group prepares to leave, and Doran, still recovering from the night before, says that in their next encounter, Jinka, and he will fight, so the boy shouldn't let himself be defeated by Reshin, the next assassin who will come after them. Then the four continue their journey, and Shinsu comments that he was surprised to see a Dangishu making friends with Katawaras, but Jinka says that nothing prevents him from eliminating the monkeys later. 
Shinsuke says he doesn't think that will happen. After all, he could have attacked the group during the night and didn't, but Jinka still doesn't trust a dang issue. At this moment, Shakamin interrupts their discussion because she wants the journey to be peaceful and fun. Jika then asks if she is on the side of humans or Katawaras, and she responds that she is only on the side of her friends. And so they continue on the path, and after another long journey, the four arrive in a village surrounded by a barrier, blocking their passage. Jinka considers taking the detour, but Shakugan explains that for some reason, Kagan insists on going through that path, and Tama respects his decision, since they were heading to his homeland. So Jika reflects that he can create a temporary hole in the barrier for only one of them to pass through, and Tama volunteers to go, negotiating their passage with the village residents. And so Jika opens a hole in the barrier and the fox crosses, but only later does his brother realize that she has never negotiated anything in her life, which concerns Shakugan and Shinsuke. Tama walks through the area without encountering anyone, despite finding no signs of a trap. Suddenly, a Katawara appears, introducing itself as Foucault, the one responsible for the barrier protecting the village. Tama asks what he is protecting everyone from, and the creature explains that the barrier shields them from changes, ensuring that sadness never appears and happiness lasts forever. Fuku asks if Tama has ever wished for nothing to change, and despite the fox's denial, the creature reads her thoughts and realizes she desired it when she lost her friend, wishing that the day of his death never arrived. Later, Fuku comments that he can also protect Tama from changes. Meanwhile, the group wonders why the fox is taking so long since the barrier continues to block their passage. At that moment, Reshin, one of the four beast leaders of the Dangeshu, appears to punish Jinka for invading the main temple. Shinsuke notices that Jinka cannot use his transformation being far from his sister, so he decides to use his spiritual sword to protect his friend. However, Jinka perceives his intention and says he will handle the monk even without Tama's power. Next, Reshin draws his weapon, emerging from his clothing, explaining that it's a special tool called the Sack of Myriads, received from Lord Yezin, allowing him to retrieve anything from any direction. Thus, the two begin to fight while Tama asks why Fuku was protecting the village. The Katawara explains that the residents feared the arrival of a worse day such as war or a plague, and this fear gave rise to him. Then Tama states that nothing guarantees the future will be worse and time heals all wounds, bringing various kinds of fruits so the barrier is not helping the village and should be removed. Fuku refuses to do so and in a moment of anger, Tama accidentally punches him, causing the creature to leave. Subsequently, Tama searches for him in the area, realizing the current state of the village. The fox then calls Fuko so they can talk. The creature appears, reiterating its intent to protect Tama and all the residents, preventing her from ever feeling the sadness she experienced when she lost her friend. Tama takes the opportunity to reveal that she was indeed very happy when she lived with Genzu and suffered greatly from his loss. However, time passed and she gained a foster brother and other friends, so she's happy with her current life. Fuku insists on protecting her happiness with a barrier, but Tama explains that it doesn't work that way because he won't be able to shield anyone from time. Then the fox mentions that the village was isolated from the rest of the world, leading to a tragic end since it lacked access to trade, traffic, and other necessities. This leaves Fuku feeling sad, and he explains that he was just following the purpose of his existence, which is basically to protect people from changes. Then Tama says that he fulfilled his duty and can now rest. She thanks the creature for doing a good job, making Fuku cry. It's the first time someone has thanked him for his service. And so the creature disappears, leaving in peace, causing the barrier to vanish in sequence. The disappearance of the barrier distracts Jinka in his fight, worry about his sister. So his opponent throws the boy away, sending him into the village. His friends are concerned, but seconds later, he reappears in his transformed state and lands a powerful blow on Reshin, sending the dang issue flying. However, even though he defeats his opponent, Jinka seems a bit disappointed for not being able to win against the dang issue without transforming. Soon, he cheers up upon seeing Tama happy that her brother needed her. Shinsuke then asks how the fox managed to break the barrier, and she quickly explains that everyone in the village died without the world knowing, and a sad Katawara fulfilled its life purpose. And so, with the barrier gone, the group continues their journey, while Tama reflects that Katawaras have a longer lifespan than humans, meaning that at some point, she will experience the pain of losing her brother, just like all her friends. Further ahead, the group pauses in a place filled with Katawara stones and Tama observes how Shinsuke is managing to coexist normally with the creatures. Then the fox uses the situation as an example to speak to her brother about how humans and Katawaras can be good friends and asks why he wants to obtain a Katawara body so badly. Tama says she doesn't care whether he's a human or not, but Jinka responds that, unlike her, he does care about that. Then he moves away from his sister, reflecting that despite knowing humans and Katawaras can coexist, 
He has already made his decision to stop being a human because he is aware that their lifespan is much shorter, and he doesn't want to leave Tama alone, as he wishes to be by her side forever. At that moment, Jinka's thoughts are interrupted when he spots a pregnant woman in need of help. And so the group takes her to a cabin in the area to provide all the necessary assistance for her. Next, Tama informs the village elder, a Katawara mountain, that they found a pregnant woman who said she was on her way to her homeland, which is nearby. Then the group explains that she needs rest, and the monster agrees to shelter the woman until the baby is born. After arranging a shelter for her to stay safe, Shinsuke asks why the woman isn't scared to see so many creatures around her, and Jinka explains that he used a talisman to ease her pain and make her see everyone in the place as humans. Shinsu comments that he found Jinka's gesture thoughtful, and Tama suggests that the group stay in that place to take care of the woman. Meanwhile, in a Dangishu temple, Master Yezin, the leader of the monks, talks with Jinan and Doran and notices that while one is too formal, the other is too relaxed. Doran finds his master's observation amusing and comments that a good warrior knows how to be both. Then he shows off his physique, but Yezin finds this attitude shameful and decides to focus on discussing Doran's next mission, which will be to eliminate Jinka. At night, Shinsu dedicates himself to training with his sword, and Shakugan approaches him to tell him that the noise is disturbing the elder's sleep. He apologizes, realizing only then that he's training right on top of the Katawara mountain and notices that his hands are already wounded from training so much. Shakugan asks Shinsu if he really wants to become strong, and he replies, as usual, that the weak have no place in this world. He shares his desire to accomplish great deeds like the rest of the group, and to try to cheer up his friend, Shakugan reminds Shinsuk that he was the one who ran to help her when she needed it. Then the girl becomes embarrassed by her comment and tries to leave, but Kagan stops her, taking control of her body, and decides to help Shinsuk use Arabuki, his sorcerer's sword, as a way to thank him for caring about her. And so Shinsuk tries to use his new weapon, but ends up causing a mini explosion just like last time. Kagan then instructs him to talk to the sword, to treat it as an individual, and to help Shinsu do this, Kagan asks him to imagine the spiritual energy of Arabuki, and how it would be if it were a person. He follows the advice and imagines the sword saying that it is a relic of the Reidu clan, possessing spiritual powers and therefore will not be wielded by a powerless nobody like him. Kagan says that Shinsu grasped the idea of the training and praises him for getting his message so quickly. He explains that it was similar to the way he learned to use the sword, because as a child he imagined the spirit of a samurai, and trained the same move repeatedly. Kagan realizes that this explains why Shinsuke has a much better vertical strike than the rest of his strikes and encourages him to continue training to become worthy of Shakiyaku, saying he wants the two of them to marry someday. Immediately, the girl takes control of her body, dying of embarrassment at Kagan's comment. She and the Katawara have a quick argument, and then Shakugan runs off, leaving the guy alone and completely nervous about that marriage thing. However, this actually encourages him to continue training and Jinka, who overhears the whole conversation, complains about having to put up with that romance. The next day, Shakugan takes a look at the pregnant woman's belly and asks if she has already chosen a name for the baby. The woman explains that she hasn't decided what to call her son yet and asks for Shakugan's name. The girl starts to answer Shakiyaku, her old name, but quickly changes and introduces herself as Shakugan. Then the woman decides to take Shaku in her honor and names her baby Shakiyaku, not knowing that this is her original name. This leaves the girl touched. Next, Jinka suggests the name Kagan, if it's a boy, and the mother approves the idea, which makes Shakugan even more excited to see the baby's arrival. Jinka remembers her saying that she's with the group when her sister interrupts his thoughts, calling him to feel the baby too. So with much reluctance, Jinka approaches the belly, but before he can touch it, the woman goes into labor. Meanwhile, Doran and Reshin arrive at the mountain's gate, and the man tells the village elder that he and his partner are after a wanted boy. Suddenly, Reshin interrupts and starts threatening the Katawara, saying he'll chop him up if he refuses to hand over who they want. But Doran silences the monk and politely asks the elder for permission for both of them to go after the Dangishu's enemy. While Doran explains that he doesn't want to cause any trouble for the village, discreetly the elder asks the other Katawaras to go warn the visitors of the danger and ask everyone to hide in the cabin. Then the Katawara gives permission for the two Dangishu to move forward. Reshin then informs the elder that he saw the group they are looking for with his remote vision, and therefore, if he tries to hide the four, the people of his village will be attacked. However, Dorn informs his partner that this won't be necessary because Jinka and the others have facilitated their work by coming to meet them. Jinka already appears in his transfiguration form, while Shakugan releases his Katawara arms to lend his support, and Shinsuke thinks that if things get tough, he will be forced to use his spiritual sword. 
Despite the apprehension, everyone knew they had no other option but to fight because if they tried to hide, they would be found sooner or later, so showing themselves in that way was the safest way to keep the woman and her baby safe. Then Doran informs Reshin that he is eager to duel with Jinka and therefore he should stay out in the fight. The man agrees but notices that one member of the boys' group is missing and goes to look for where the fox is hiding. Meanwhile, Doran takes on his tiger form to fight against Jinka. His new appearance worries Shakugan and Shinsuke, but everyone stays firm in their position. And so the duel between the two begins and Doran advances, using his tiger speed to deliver several consecutive blows until finally landing a punch on Jinka, sending the boy flying away, leaving his friends worried. Doran boasts about his technique, explaining that it derives from an ancient Western martial art that focuses on the strength of the fists. Chika becomes furious for being beaten by a human technique and unleashes his attack called Flaming Princess's Roar, followed by the flagellation of the ancient tree. However, everyone is surprised to see that Jinka's two strongest blows had no effect on Doran, and the man scoffs at his resistance. Then he advances on the boy to deliver his final blow called Fist of the Fallen Dragon. To block his attack, Jinka uses the earthy fist of the monarch, but ends up being beaten once again. Then he tries to use the earthy fist of the monarch again, finally managing to injure Doran, leaving both of them wounded. But Jinka is more affected by his opponent's powerful blow. Suddenly, the boy starts laughing like a maniac, not even understanding why, and becomes excited to continue the duel. This leaves Doran even more excited, and the two compete in the strength of their fists while laughing in a bizarre way. Shinsuke watches their fight and wonders if that is what strength is, finding the competition somewhat frightening. At that moment, Reshin informs that he has discovered that the fox is hiding inside the cabin. Shakugan, realizing that her friend and the pregnant woman are in danger, rushes to attack the Dangeshu, but discovers that it was just an illusion of the enemy. Next, Reshin throws a giant rock towards the group. This ends up distracting Jinka, who takes a precise blow from Doran, and the rock passes through the fight and goes straight towards Shinsuke and Shakugan. So the girl decides to find a way to stop the rock from proceeding, because otherwise it will go straight to the cabin where Tama is assisting the pregnant woman in her delivery. And so the girl asks for help from the Katawara within her and Kagan quickly takes control of her body and uses her arms to hold the giant rock. With that, Doran notices that the group is trying to protect someone and goes to ask Jinka who it is, but realizes that his opponent was knocked out with his punch. At the same time, Shinsu worries about Shakugan having to hold something as heavy as the rock, and she tells him to go to the cabin to take Tama and the woman to a safe place. However, as soon as he starts heading towards the cabin, several clones of Reshin appear in front of him, blocking his path. Doran questions his partner for interfering in his fight, and Reshin explains that the two of them were tasked with saving the honor of the Dange Shu, and therefore they must deal with the whole group, as well as anyone who gets in their way, including the people hiding in the cabin. This makes Doran furious. He advances on his partner, but realizes that it was just another illusion. Realizing that all the monks were fake, Shinsuke decides to continue on his way to the cabin, but before he can leave, the real Reshin appears and delivers a fatal blow to Shakugan. Shinsu panics seeing the injured girl and tries to use his spiritual sword to fight, but ends up suffering from an explosion. Reshin leaves the two injured and the guy worries about Shakugan, who besides having a serious chest wound continues to fight to hold the giant rock. So desperate, he shouts for the fox to help, but she remains busy assisting in the woman's delivery. And so Shakyaku and Kagan realize that their end is near and the girl remains calm, knowing that she had a happy life full of adventures alongside her friends, remembering each of them fondly and gratefully. At that moment, Shakugan hears the baby's cry, who has finally been born, and is moved by his arrival into the world. Then she transforms into a smaller rock to prevent the other from reaching the cabin. Meanwhile, Reshin prepares to deliver a fatal blow to Jinka, who is still unconscious, but Doran stops him and makes it clear that if they don't leave at that moment, he will be killed. So his partner accepts his decision, taking the tiger's threat seriously. And so when the boy wakes up, Doran apologizes for Reshin's actions and for interfering in their fight, making it clear that he only desires a fair exchange of punches, but that he will leave it for their next encounter. Afterwards, Shinka observes the giant rock stop and is shocked to realize that the stone beside it has Shakugan's spiritual energy. He and Shinsuke are devastated by the loss of the half Katawara human when Tama appears, calling them to meet the newly born twins who were named Kagan and Shakiyaku. Seeing the baby's name in honor of Shakugan, Chika begins to cry and his sister is moved by his reaction. Meanwhile, Shinsuke leaves the cabin and also cries at the same time he sees what remains of his friend, who should be happy at that moment, holding the twins. The mother of the babies also feels Shakugan's loss and laments that the girl is not there to hold her children. 
Then, one of the Katawara from the village explains that they will take the woman to their village when she recovers, and the group prepares to leave. Before they go, the village elder explains that Shakyugan is actually still alive. She has depleted almost all of her spiritual energy and has entered a deep sleep, but she might awaken in a few hundred years. However, there is also the possibility that it may never happen if her spirit connects and merges with the Earth. Despite knowing that Shakyugan is still alive and has a good chance of waking up in the future, the group continues to feel her loss. Among them, Shinsu feels at the most taking on a worn and resentful appearance and developing a desire for the blood of the Dangeshu. Near another village, he talks to his sword, Arabuki, and Tama asks how he's doing with it. Shinsuke explains that the weapon told him to return it to Radu because he's not good enough. Tama remarks that for an imaginary conversation, Arabuki has a lot of personality, but Shinsuke insists it's not imaginary. At that moment, a Katawara appears and introduces himself as Kagamori, the guardian of the next village. He asks what the group is doing there and Shinsuke, already impatient, almost starts a fight with Kagamori for no reason. Tama intervenes quickly and prevents him from causing trouble, introducing the three and making it clear they are just passing through. Kagamori notes that none of them seem to be bandits and Jinka takes the opportunity to ask if there's any accommodation in the village. The Katawara says yes, but if they want to spend the night, they should stay in a cabin near the riverbank, because he doesn't want to stay in his village with Shinsuke's ominous spirit. And so, the tree of us stays in the cabin Kagamori assigned, where Shinsuke continues to argue with his sword, trying to make it obey him. Tama observes that what happened to Shakugan has affected Jinka and Shinsu greatly. In Jinka's case, it's not a significant problem as he is learning that he's not as melancholic as he thought. Shinsu, on the other hand, is a cause for concern as he has been consumed by anger. This leads Tama to imagine what it would be like if Shakugan were still with them. At that moment, the three overhear a conversation among the villagers from outside the cabin. The boy questions why his sister has to serve as a sacrifice to Kagamori. The girl remains calm and explains that he protects everyone in the village from bandits and warriors and in return, only asks for a sacrifice every four years. However, the boy refuses to accept the loss of his older sister, and the girl cries as she also doesn't want to die. The three listen to the conversation in silence and Shinsu decides to take action to end the sacrifices in the village. Tama asks him not to interfere because Kagamori protects them, but Shinsu becomes furious, claiming that he is devouring the village. The fox remains calm and explains that it was a choice made by the villagers, and it's not up to him to disagree. A sacrifice every four years is a fair agreement. This leaves Shinsu even more irritated. He grabs Tama and asks if it's just a matter of numbers for her. Jacob protects his sister and asks him not to confront her. Shinsu then mocks them for calling themselves the siblings of world renewal when she's just another Katawara. After that, he leaves the cabin, determined to confront Kagamori. Tama tries to stop him with a snake but he manages to break the illusion, surprising the fox. Realizing that Shinsu won't give up, she goes after him to deliver an outfit that the stone Katawaras gave to them and asks him to come back alive, saying she doesn't want to lose anyone else. Shinsu thanks his friend and apologizes for what he said to her earlier. Then he continues on his way to Kagamori, while conversing with his sword, stating that he has rid himself of his fears and doubts. Next, he senses Kagamori's presence and calls out to him. Kagamori appears hidden behind a tree, but before they can fight, Reshin suddenly appears, delivering a fatal blow to Kagamori. Seeing the man who killed Shakugan, Shinsu becomes furious and tries to attack. Reshin dodges and celebrates that the boy doesn't want to run away, making it easier for him to attack, as he is now free and without Doran to stop him. Shinsu tries to attack again, but the Dandishu dodges and launches a strike that throws him into a rock, causing him to faint. Reshin mocks Shinsu for thinking he could get stronger overnight and declares that he will kill him with the same weapon he used to kill his friend. Then Reshin begins to consider where to deliver his final blow, enjoying the moment, while Shinsu's mind ends up in the inner world of his sword. Arabuki asks him to surrender control of his body so that the sword can take over, promising to turn him into the best possessed swordsman. Instead of doing that, Shinsu makes it clear to Arabuki who is in control, himself as the swordsman, while the sword can't even move on its own. He threatens to throw the spiritual weapon into a pit, surprising Arabuki. Shinsu then demands its powers, willing to take them by force. And so just as Reshin decides to deliver his final blow, Shinsu wakes up, finally able to use the power of Arabuki. He uses it to cut off Reshin's arm. The Dangeshu is caught off guard but quickly regenerates his arm and reveals his face, showing a mouth capable of firing powerful shots. After shooting, he throws several swords at Shinsu but the boy manages to dodge all the attacks while Arabuku warns that his rage won't make his attack stronger, still acting as if Shinsuke is weak. Nevertheless, he swears to eliminate his opponent and tries to launch another attack, 
but ends up losing his sword and being disarmed. Even so, Shinsu doesn't give up and faces Reshin with his fists until the Dangishu shoots a blast from his mouth, making him retreat. The monk, furious at having been beaten, vows to make Shinsu pay. At that moment, Kagamori appears and punches him with the little life he has left. Shinsu is surprised and realizes that only in that moment does Katawara give his last breath. However, he doesn't care because all he wants is to end Reshin. He grabs his sword and prepares to avenge Shakugan, but suddenly starts seeing Kagan and Shakyaku, the two versions of the girl, saying that what they liked about him was precisely his gentle side, and that is what makes him strong. Shinsu tries to resist the visions and attempts to follow the violent path, claiming he is doing it for them. However, he soon admits that he is doing it for himself, and this is his punishment for not being strong enough. Yet the swordsman continues to hesitate in finishing off the Dangeshu when he sees the gentle face of Shakyaku. At this moment, a hologram emerges from Reshin's clothes, commenting that this body was more expensive and more laborious than the other modified humans. Then the hologram's voice introduces itself to Shinsuke as the leader of the Dangeshu Yezin. Next, Reshin wakes up and his master orders him to return. The monk refuses to leave before eliminating Shinsuke, but Yezin threatens to explode him if he refuses to comply with his command. So Reshin agrees to leave and asks Shinsuke to say his name. The boy explains that he is called Takikichi, from the village Hachikusa, because Shinsuke knew is just a made-up name. Then his opponent explains that he is called Barry Zalmor and that Reshin is his nickname. After the two properly introduce themselves, they swear to make the other pay. Then the dang issue disappears and Shinsuke continues his way back to the cabin, realizing that he has finally gained the strength he wanted so much to rid himself of the oppression he feels, but was all in vain. On the way, one of the villagers questions why he attacked Kagamori and expresses concern about the safety of the place without the Guardian. Shinsuke says that the villagers can protect themselves without needing anyone, but the man says that none of them knows how to handle weapons and therefore cannot fight. This angers Shinsuke and yells at the man that if that's the case, everyone should die because the weak have no place in this world. The man runs away in fear and Shinsuke begins to question what he is doing by attacking a Katawara and shouting at a simple frightened peasant. He becomes frustrated with everything around him, and when he approaches the cabin, he finds Tama and Jinko waiting for his arrival to leave before the villagers decide to confront them for attacking the Guardian. Shinsuke regrets it, as he didn't even kill Kagamori himself, realizing that this may be the reason for his irritation. Then he apologizes to the two for having to leave the lodging to sleep in the open, and Jinko replies that he is used to him bringing trouble. Later, the trio begins to leave, and Shinsuke sees from afar the boy and his sister, who would have been sacrificed. They signal thanks, but Shinsuke does not respond in any way, still irritated with the whole situation. At night, already camped, Shinsuke reveals that his real name is Takichi, and Tama mentions that she found it odd for a peasant to have a samurai's name. Then she asks what his goal is and why he is traveling with them. He replies that he still wants to become strong enough not to be oppressed. Jinka then questions if he intends to achieve this goal by diving headfirst into deadly battles with two borrowed swords. Shinsuke becomes irritated with the comment and questions Jinka for saying he loves the Katawaras but keeps attacking them, while showing hatred for humans and protecting them. The two start challenging each other and Tama stops them with just one command. Then Shinsuke says that, at the moment, he just wants to eliminate the Dangishu to prevent them from repeating what they did to Shakugan. Jinka agrees on this point as spiritually modified humans are an insult to all Katawaras, according to him. Next, Tegma observes how the group lost only one person, yet everything became quieter. During the night, as usual, Shinsu dedicates himself to his sword training to become strong, and the next morning, they set out on the journey until they reach a place where Jinka feels an intense power. Suddenly, two giant Tengas appear in the group's path, along with a girl who introduces herself as a new ally to fight the Dangeshu. Shinsu finds her a bit suspicious, and Tama notes that she must be someone extraordinary to control such huge Tengas. Then the girl tells the three in a hurry before he catches up with them, making the trio ask who she was referring to, who she is, and where they are going. The girl answers the questions and explains that she is a mountain goddess, a spirit of water and wood, and they are on their way to a safe place to rest and need to hurry, because the Danishu's dragon is on their tail. And so the three follow the goddess while Tama realizes they should have guessed that Jinan is the next to go after the group as three of the beast leaders have already failed to defeat them. Then Shinsuke asks why the goddess left her bodyguards behind. She explains that she doesn't need protection and comments that the fairy eyes must have noticed. None of them understands whom the goddess referred to and she explains that she is talking to Jinka, mentioning that his eyes were sealed. His sister and Shinsuke notice that his eyes are each of a different color, but the goddess says they can talk more about it later when they reach the location. 
So the group follows the goddess until they reach the entrance of a cave, and inside, they are surprised by the appearance of the place. The goddess thanks the three for trusting her by following her, saying that there they are safe from the dragon. Then she invites them to talk peacefully. Meanwhile, at the cave entrance, the two giant tengas stand guard, and the dragon man asks them to clear the way. The creatures refuse, explaining they are following the boss's orders. Then Jianan says that he and his companion also have orders to enter the cave and ask Senyan to deal with them. The Tagus get excited to face the boy, but in a matter of seconds, he leaves them in pieces, clearing the way for his master. Back inside the cave, the goddess explains that the old Dagon who told her about the group is an old friend who communicates with her through a communicating stone. Additionally, the goddess reveals her desire to become an ally of the trio, which Jinka thinks is an excellent idea. But his sister is already worried about what the goddess wants from them, as they are already indebted to her for being protected from the dragon man. The goddess then confesses that she indeed wants one thing from the trio, because she wants to awaken Tazen, the castle where the Dangi Shu conduct their experiments. She explains that Tazen is a lesser deity of the mountain just like her, but the monks brainwash him to turn him into a servant. Then Jika asks what to do to bring Tazen back, and the goddess says it's just a matter of giving him a slap, but the group finds that idea absurd. Meanwhile, Jinan praises Senya for defeating the Tengus. However, the bodies of the creatures transform into several crows that say, since they were defeated, they will give a clue about where the group they are looking for is. But each bird speaks in a different direction, making Jinan realize that it's a spell to leave him and Senya lost, meaning they are at the entrance of another cave. So the boy scares away the crows, and his master comments that facing real spells like that will be good for him. At the same time, the goddess explains to the trio that she only needs a guide to Tazen, because the Dang Ishu's barrier prevents her from locating her friend, and after they show her the location, she will deal with him. In exchange for the favor, the goddess promises to take one of the three most valuable soldiers of the Dang Ishu out of play. Then the group reflects that she is not referring to Tazen or the Dragon Man, and the goddess clarifies that she is talking about the Fox Kazunoha, which shocks Tama. The goddess tells the story of a man who belonged to a family of merchants and enlisted to become a Dangishu, thanks to his spiritual power. She says the man was very interested in spells and enchanted weapons, preferring studies over combat, and one day he was sent with a troop to fulfill the important mission of stopping the fox Kuzunova. However, instead of completing the task, he ended up falling in love with her, and for some reason, the fox returned his feelings and the couple joined forces to exterminate the troop, using transfiguration. The goddess then reveals that the man is Yezin, the current leader of the Dang Ishu, and the fox Kuzunoha, Tama's mother, who is horrified and ashamed to learn about her mother's relationship with the monk leader. Jika asks if this means that Yezin is her father, but Tama is irritated by the question and reminds her brother that she is over 100 years old and older than the man. Shinsuke then asks if the Dang Ishu holds the power of Tama's mother, but the goddess explains that actually Yezin told the order that he managed to kill a fox and fulfill the mission, and keeps her hidden in a place where they both study how to turn Katawaras into humans, which resulted in the discovery of how to make spiritually modify humans like Shakugan. Upon hearing this, Shinsuke wishes for Yezin's death, and Tama agrees with her friend, saying that if her mother, who has always been diving headfirst into new passions, is involved in the experiments, she should also pay for her actions. At that moment, a bunch of crows arrive in the cave, along with a girl who falls on top of Shinsuke. Her name is Rinzu, and she tells the goddess that she came to give information about the dragon man. Afterwards, she says that he is meditating in the spiritual pocket of the mountain, trying to break the disorientation spell. Then the goddess thanks the crows for their help and dismisses them so that the birds can rest. Next, Shinsu complains that Rinzu stepped on him and didn't even apologize, but she ignores him, getting distracted when she sees Jinka. The girl falls in love at first sight with him, but he rejects her and questions why there's a human there. The goddess tells him and the rest of the group that she found Rinzu and raised her as a kind of secretary and apprentice, then she conjures up an image of Jinan, explaining that they can observe the location where the Dragon Man is, which excites her to play a prank on him. So if the Dragon Man meditates peacefully, as Rinzu had informed, when a girl sent by the goddess appears on the scene trying to seduce him. Jamin tells Senya to take care of her, but before the boy can attack, the girl takes off her clothes, making her master immediately cover his eyes after all, he's just a child. Then Jinan yells at her, who immediately turns into a small animal and runs away. The goddess enjoys watching the scene and decides to send a message to the whole mountain to distract the dragon and gain time for her to train the group. Tama asks if there will be enough time for training. Then the goddess snaps her fingers and explains that she distorted time so that it passes slower for them until dawn. 
Then she explains that she will focus on unlocking Jinka's fairy eyes, as well as increasing his spiritual power and removing subconscious biases from the whole group so that they can acquire the power to shape their own destinies, because dragon castles and foxes are powerful, but they do not compare to the three, who possess limitless powers. Next, without giving any warning, the goddess transports the three to an illusory world, where each will separately carry out their training, the Tama ending up in the middle of a lake, where she must cross and reach the shore, while Shinsuke ends up in a place where his goal is to pass through a huge rock that blocks his way, at the same time that Jinka ends up in an open field, where the goddess also is. She calls him the apprentice of Kakugetsusei and tells him that she met his master, who kept hitting on her and got beaten up a lot for it until he became very strong and came to be known as the Phoenix Slayer, so it can be said that the goddess is the master of Jinka's master. She says that the two are somewhat alike because they are extraordinary, but deep down they are only human. Then the goddess calls for Rinzu, who appears immediately, and explains that she wants her apprentice and Jinka to fight, and if Rinzu wins, she will cast a spell for Jinka to fall in love with her. Afterwards, the goddess wishes them good luck and explains that in that dimension there are no dead, so they must only avoid their minds collapsing. And so the fight begins and Rinzu, eager to achieve victory, and especially her prize, summons a weapon and faces Jinka, who can barely react and has his arm cut. He feels pain, but when he realizes his arm is already back on his body, as if nothing had happened, he understands it was something from his mind. Rinzu tries to attack again, but Jinka dodges while trying to understand if that dimension is just an illusion, but thinks something like that wouldn't make him stronger. The goddess notices that the boy is not focused on the fight and says that if he keeps being so stubborn, it will be harder, and he'll probably be the last to fulfill his objective in the test. Meanwhile, Shinsu tries to cut the rock in his way with his spiritual sword but fails and Arabuki blames the swordsman for the failure. The boy tries once more but fails again. At that moment, a girl appears and explains that it's just a small hill that's separated from the peak. Being another mountain goddess and Shinsu observes that Katawaras come in all sorts of forms. At the same time, a girl like her talks to Tama, explaining she's just watching her take her test. However, the fox complains because the little goddess is distracting her and hindering her concentration to walk on the water and reach the shore. Tama tries to focus, but the girl makes a face, making her laugh and, consequently, sink into the water, leading the fox to understand that distraction is part of her training. Meanwhile, Jinan continues scaring off several girls who appear to him, fleeing in their animal forms. The dragon man gets tired of them and authorizes Senya to act on her own and defeat Chinka if she finds him after all, the boy is the first enhanced human to contain a thousand Katawaras within his body, and thus must prove he is worthy of such power. So Senya goes on her way alone and seeking to locate Jinka, when she encounters a scared little Katawara who hands her a common toy in exchange for safe escape. Back to Jinka's training, he keeps fighting with Rinzu, who finds the right position to hit him with her huge axe. But before delivering her blow, the girl changes her weapon to a cat paw hammer, reminding the goddess she told her not to hold back. Jinka is startled to learn that Rinzu isn't giving her all while she hopes he'll surrender soon. Next, the girl conjures several explosive talismans and throws them one by one in his direction. Then the goddess decides to take advantage of that moment to explain to Jinka about his fairy eyes, making it clear she won't repeat anything she says, forcing him to dodge the attacks while paying attention to her explanation. The goddess explains that fairy eyes are eyes that have received special spiritual powers and that they only appear in twin siblings. At that moment, Rinzu gets excited to discover there's another Jinka somewhere, which annoys him and he hits her on the head. Then the girl continues launching her explosive talismans at him, and the goddess notices that Jinka doesn't seem surprised by that information because he already saw his brother in the Yamato clan living happily with his parents. She explains that twins born with fairy eyes tend to attract Katawaras, which is why Jinka was sent away from his clan and raised by his master, Kokugetsusei, who chose to take him in. Chinka is surprised, as he didn't know how he ended up with his master and the goddess asks him not to hate his parents, his twin brother, or Kokugetsusei. Then the boy becomes indignant, and asks why he was chosen to be abandoned and trained hard in a cold cabin in the mountains while his brother just played in their mansion. The goddess says Jinka is very innocent and very human because he refuses to accept his own fate and tries to become a Katawara. Then she orders Rinzu, who was distracted by the story, not to stop her attacks. So the girl keeps launching her talismans for Jinka to dodge, and the goddess continues her explanation about the fairy eyes, saying that twins who have them share their lives, and when one dies, the other dies too. Then she comments on how Jinka has gone through many misfortunes after all, he attracts danger and shares his life in exchange for a little spiritual strength and a special power that he's forbidden to use and thus has an unhappy life, reminding the boy that he was abandoned and lost friends, as well as everything he had. 
However, despite everything, Jinka disagrees with the goddess because he has friends, a sister, and has seen death and life and their sufferings only hurt because he is an unhappy. Suddenly, his vision changes, and the goddess agrees that only Jinka can define whether he is happy or not, so he must live as he wishes, and the secret to removing the seal from his eyes was to accept his existence and his place in the world. So with Jinka accepting who he is, he can see the goddess's power, as well as his little opponents and her explosive talismans, which aren't as powerful as they seem, so he doesn't need to dodge them. Then Jinka sees his own energy and is surprised that humans and Katawaras have the same level of energy. Meanwhile, Shinsuke, who is tired of trying to cut the rock, finally thinks of simply passing through it after all, the goal of his training was just to pass through that point. The guy remembers that Arabuki can fly and his sword lifts him. Then he asks the mountain goddess if he could do that, and she confirms explaining that his spiritual strength and imagination are shaping his powers, which impresses her. And so Shinsuke is the first of the trio to achieve his goal and finish the test. Because of this, he returns to the real world along with the girl and ends up falling right where Senya was, ending with his spiritual sword at his neck. In the dimension, Jinka wonders what he's seeing with his fairy eyes, unsure if it's Rinzu's spiritual energy, her soul, or the light her life emits. He becomes even more confused to see that the light the goddess emits is the same, realizing that this means humans and Katawaras have similar forms of life. So he gently asks Rinzu to surrender and the love-struck girl obeys, allowing the guy to win the duel in the only possible way because otherwise, he wouldn't be able to defeat Rinzu. After winning, Jinka asks the goddess if he completed his challenge, but she explains that he hasn't fully freed his subconscious yet, so he'll need to train a little more. Meanwhile, in the real world, Shinsuke is paralyzed with his spiritual sword at Senya's neck. The little goddess tells him to eliminate the boy because he's one of the humans modified by the Dangeshu, possessing incredible potential, and is the apprentice of the Dragon Man, commenting that it's even a miracle that the guy is in control of that fight. However, even with the girl telling him what to do and Senya himself agreeing with her, Shinsu continues to hesitate to harm the child. Then the little goddess warns that the boy has the ability to tear him apart in the blink of an eye and may one day become even more powerful than the dragon, a true potential god demon. Shinsuke is terrified to imagine what that boy will become one day, but still, he doesn't care because that doesn't change the fact that Senya is still just a child. So he cries while becoming even more furious with the Dangeshu for taking only a child to perform their experiments and fill him with monsters, and Senya is surprised to see how his opponent was moved by his situation. Then Shinsuke releases the boy, ignoring the goddess and her sword, Arabuki, who also thinks this attitude is a mistake. The swordsman accepts his fate and asks Senya to eliminate him quickly. The boy transforms his arm into Katawara, but instead of hitting Shinsuke, he only breaks his toy and leaves, unable to harm someone who spared him in that way. After Senya leaves, the goddess agrees with Shinsuke that the boy is just a child, but reminds him that he has just spared the life of the future king of monsters. Back to Jinka, the goddess says that the best way to train the guy is for him to have to face the dragon man. Jinka finds the idea absurd and says that he doesn't have the ability to defeat Jainan, and if he fights the dragon ten times, he will lose all the fights because the power difference between the two is too great. Then the goddess asks what would happen if he were to face the dragon a thousand or even ten thousand times, and Jinka admits that maybe, with a miracle, he could win one of those thousands of fights, which makes the goddess congratulate him for winning the challenge, which basically was for him to realize that in one of those ten thousand future and hypothetical times, he managed to defeat his opponent. So to prove to Jinka that he can face the dragon and survive, the goddess decides to show it in practice, explaining that to complete his training, he will be transported to where Jinan is. Before Jinka can question anything with the goddess, he is transported and ends up right in front of the dragon, who is as surprised as him by the scene. The boy falls into the river and drifts away, being carried away by the current of the water while Jinan wonders if that was or wasn't a vision. And so Jinka finishes his training of only Tama remaining, who makes sure she can stand in the water before trying to cross to the other side of the lake. But when the little goddess warns that only she was left to fulfill the challenge, the fox worries about leaving her friends waiting. So the goddess warns that they will wait a thousand years if necessary because besides being able to adjust time, Tama will only leave that dimension when she completes the challenge or when her mind collapses. Because of this, Tama finally focuses on maintaining her concentration, and after a while, she manages to finish her goal and meet up with the rest of the group in a cabin, where Jinka and Shinsuke demonstrate that they had no idea how long they waited for her, acting as if they had only waited for a few minutes. With the three of them having completed the training, the little goddess says it's time for them to leave. She explains that she will raise a barrier in the mountains to trap the dragon man for a few days, so that they, along with Rinzu, can attack the temple of the Dangeshu, having to face only the other beast leaders, Yezin and Kuzunoha. 
However, Tama says that before they do that, they must go back and face Jinin, because that is their best chance against the dragon. Jinka and Shinsuke are surprised by the fox's decision, and the little goddess warns that despite the evolution they had with the training they received, they are all still far from having a spiritual power capable of facing the dragon. Tama explains that she is aware of this, and intends to face her opponent because she has a plan. So the goddess accepts the fox's decision, since she had in the group two warriors who practically perform miracles, needing only one more to defeat Jinan. And so the goddess bids farewell to the three and says they will meet again if they manage to survive. Then she disappears along with Rinzu leaving the trio on their own. Then Jinka asks if his sister is sure that this is the best chance they have to face the dragon. Tama confirms and explains that inside the mountain goddess's barrier, they are all together, and that way they can force her into battle. Shinsu and Jinka say that the goddess probably won't want to interfere in their fight, but Tama remains confident in how valuable the group is to her. After all, the goddess wouldn't have trained the three of them if they weren't needed. However, she knew that if she was wrong, the trio would be heading into a battle they couldn't win. And so they head to the mountain where Jinan is, and on the way, Taman explains that the plan is to attack with full force, and then retreat and lure the dragon back to the goddess's home. After a while, they find Jinan, who initially ignores them considering none of them have enough spiritual power to be a threat. This leaves Shinsu irritated, and he says that even insects know how to bite, and even if this is his end, he will die biting his opponent. But Tama asks her friend to save all that courage for Reshin, the bag man, because he won't want to lose his life in vain. In other words, that fight depended solely on Jinka. However, before he could take the Fox of Blood to activate the transfiguration, Jinan decides to attack, sending the boy flying away. So while the Dragon Man transforms to punish Jinka for the attack on the Dangishu Temple, Senya makes sure Tama and Shinsuke don't meddle in the fight. The boy introduces himself to the two and makes it clear that if they try anything, they'll be taken out. Meanwhile, the dragon gets ready to throw a punch at Jinka, who freezes upon seeing the immense spiritual power of his opponent. However, Jinan misses the blow, which surely would have been fatal, because he thought Jinka would try to approach for a fight. So he tries to attack again, but misses once more, making the group realize they didn't just witness one miracle, but two. Jinan wonders why the ground is so unstable and wonders if it happened by chance or if Jinka purposely led him to that spot. Meanwhile, the boy reflects on narrowly escaping death twice, recalling the goddess's words about him potentially defeating the dragon man in a hypothetical future. Then Jinka starts laughing like a maniac, and everyone is left bewildered. Jainan decides to ignore his opponent's laughter and throws a punch, but the boy dodges and unleashes several talismans, which the powerful dragon easily destroys, leaving Shinsuke and Tama impressed by such strength. However, the talismans were just a distraction for Jinka to create a clone to distract Jinan, while he goes to his sister to complete the transformation. And so, Jinka transforms, sprouting several foxtails as usual, but he notices an extra tail, and feels a much greater force than before when using the transformation. Because of this, he asks his sister what training she underwent, realizing it's the reason for the change, and she responds that she cultivated her soul through meditation and reflection for about 10 years. Later, Jinan asks why Jinka wants to fight and warns that the more he resists, the slower and more painful his end will be. Then the guy replies that he fights for survival. Jainan acknowledges his opponent's spiritual power and reflects that with the right master, Jinka could become a formidable warrior. But none of this matters to the dragon because he must solely focus on punishing him for the attack on the temple. Tama wonders if her brother can master the technique he now possesses with a fifth tail. Meanwhile, Jinka reflects that his spiritual power is three times greater than before, although his opponent's strength still overwhelms his own. So the two resume fighting and Jinka employs his technique called Metal General's Blade, which his sister recognizes as his fifth elemental technique. The dragon avoids the attack, but Jinka was already anticipating it. He only used the blade to restrict his opponent's movements because his actual goal is to combine his five elemental techniques together, turning each tail into one of them, including the blade, the water dragon's wall, the flame princess's roar, the monarch's earthy fist, and the ancient tree's scourge. With this combination, Jinka forms a supreme attack, a spiritual explosion called Soul of the Five Elements, being the most powerful attack he possesses. To defend himself, the dragon activates an ability called Palm of Destruction, which eliminates Jinka's spiritual explosion. However, with both major attacks, both Jinka and Jinan lose an arm. The goddess watches the fight from afar along with Rinzu, impressed that Jinka is facing someone with three times more power than him and managing to equalize the damage of the fight in that way. But the boy starts losing a lot of blood and fears he'll die if it continues. Then his will to survive brings forth a sixth tail, a lightning tail. 
This leaves everyone stunned, including the goddess. Realizing his opponent's potential, Jinan begins to consider Jinka too great a danger to ignore, and uses a technique from the God of Destruction called Profane Kick of the Sea Dragon. Then the two prepare to attack again, but before significant damage is done, the goddess intervenes, placing herself between them. She stops them in seconds, shocking Senya with how easily she blocked her master's great technique. In the end, Tama was right to deduce that the goddess would interfere in the fight, but she makes it clear that this help will come at a cost to the group. Then Jinan prepares to continue fighting. So the goddess says he'll have to face her first and recommends the dragon leave quietly, since she's ten times stronger than him. As Jinan refuses to give up the fight, the goddess grabs the dragon, knocking him down and burying him in the earth. Stenya, seeing Jinan in trouble, tries to help, but the goddess stops him and traps the dragon in his sphere. This makes the boy cry out for his father, but shortly after, he too is trapped in the same way as Jinan. Everyone is surprised to discover the relationship between the master and his apprentice, but then Jinka weakens from the blood loss, worrying his sister and Rinzu. Then the goddess places something in his wound to stop the bleeding and shows she knows Tama planned to attack, counting on her interference in the fight. Because of this, she says that, as payment for her help, she wants either the fox's soul or his brother's, but she'll collect the price only after their journey is over. The group practically ignores what the goddess says, and Shinsuke observes his injured friend, realizing he still can't do anything to help his friends, just like the day they lost Shakogun. Then the goddess bids farewell to the trio and leaves her apprentice with them, asking Rinzu to inform her when they find Tazen. The three ignore the girl as they have more pressing concerns, leaving Rinzu saddened. Then they depart with her, making it as clear as possible that she wants to help them in any way she can, although none of the three care. But anyway, the group becomes a quartet again, just like it used to be. In the main temple of the Dangishu, Yezin tells Doran that Jinan and Senya were sealed by the mountain goddess and Jinka and his group are on their way there. Despite being injured, Yezin has managed to greatly increase his spiritual strength, making the upcoming fight not an easy one. Doran gets excited at the prospect of finally having a fair battle with Jinka. Yazin decides to abandon the pursuit of the boy with his assassins and opts to simply await the group's arrival, although he shows concern since he lacks the strength of Jinan and Senya. Then Doran observes that if the mountain goddess only trapped the two, it means they will be freed at some point, presenting an opportunity for Yezin to focus on new talents rather than relying solely on a strong soldier. Doran's leader realizes he's right and sees it as a good time to test the Dangishu's new combat models. Doran is so eager to face Jinka that he decides to start warming up, assuring his leader that when the group arrives, he'll be ready to face them. After Doran leaves, Yezin starts conversing with a female voice. He remarks that the tiger will pick a fight, even with the new models, a group called the Ten Advent Saints, whom Doran ends up encountering outside. Meanwhile, the group takes shelter in a cabin, and Jinka wakes up after being unconscious for a while due to his injuries from the fight with Jinan. Shinsuke asks about his arm, and Jinka remembers losing it in the duel against the dragon. Tama begins to apologize for what happened, thinking her brother is upset, but Jinka expresses pride in the fox because they managed to confront Jamin and come out alive, as she planned with only his arm as the cost. This reminds Tama that the mountain goddess also asked for one of their souls in exchange for her help, but the fox doesn't mention it to her brother. Then Shinsuk remarks that he's surprised Jinka is taking the loss of his arm so lightly as it's death for a swordsman. Jinka says he doesn't care about what he's lost and prefers to laugh at the situation. Rinzu admires Jinka's strength and only then does he notice the girl and struggles to remember her name, which upsets Rinzu despite her continued affection for him. Shinsuke says he can't laugh at the situation like Jinka, and Tama isn't finding it amusing to see another one of them injured, probably blaming herself for what happened. The fox thanks her friend for his concern, but explains that if Jinka can smile, she can too, and he should do the same. Shinsuke apologizes and explains that he can't smile because it's his fault and his weakness that caused them to lose Shakugan. Tama reminds them that their friend didn't die but only turned into stone, and they have to believe she'll come back. Shinsuke agrees that they should keep hope alive, but he clearly struggles to do so. He decides to leave the cabin to get some fresh air, and Jinka asks him to also get some food. Later, Jinka notices that despite losing his arm, he doesn't feel any pain or loss of spiritual power. In fact, he feels like he can reach even higher levels and is ready to fight at any moment. Rinzu says this is thanks to the training he received from the mountain goddess, and Tama says that if her brother is ready to fight, they'll leave the next day. Back at the Dangeshu Temple, the female voice informs Yezin that Doran is facing the Ten Advent Saints and asks if the leader won't intervene. Yezin says it's a waste of time to argue with belligerent people. Then the woman wonders who will win the fight, and he says the answer is obvious, considering the Advent Saints are newer models. 
At the same time, Doran transforms into a tiger while the saints say the beast leaders have the bad habit of acting on their own, so they'll force them to relinquish their authority and leave the battlefield. Yazin continues to explain to the woman that the tiger will easily defeat all the saints. She asks why the old model is stronger than the newer ones and he explains that it's a matter of motivation. Doran is a natural martial artist with a technique even superior to Jinnan's, despite the dragon's higher spiritual power. Back with the group after Jinka puts on the clothes left by the mountain goddess, they prepare to continue their journey. Rinzu asks them to write their names on some papers before they set off. Jinka and Shinsuk try to understand the purpose of those papers and Rinzu explains that she can make a summons. Shinsu doesn't quite grasp what that power entails and Jinka explains that it's a spell capable of teleporting humans and Katawaras to the summoner, no matter how far apart they are, leaving him surprised at the fact that Rinzu can accomplish such a feat, as it's an extremely difficult spell. To prove to him that she can make a summons, Rinzu decides to demonstrate how the spell works. And so with the paper, as if by magic, the girl summons one of the mountain goddess's crows named Kojiro, leaving the three of them amazed. Rinzu is delighted to see that she managed to impress Jinka, but he continues to look at her and her affection with disdain. Afterwards, the three of them write their names on the papers Rinzu requested and Tama notes that the summoning spell could be very useful to get them out of danger if things get tough. Rinzu confirms and explains that she also has other papers with the names of some Katawaras who volunteered to fight when they heard that the group was going to face the Dang Yashu. Tama declines help from any of the Katawaras Rinzu can summon and explains that they're not fighting for revenge, but to reform the world and bring justice to those who conduct cruel experiments on humans and Katawaras. Rinzu is surprised by the reason for the group's fight, but sees some sense in it when the fox explains that she loves humans while Jinka loves Katawaras. However, Shinsuke makes it clear that unlike the two of them, he's in this fight for revenge. Tama doesn't question Shinsuke's motives and continues explaining to Rinzu to avoid involving Katawaras in the battle and to use his summoning spell only for the group's protection, which makes the crow Kojiro observe that it won't be an easy fight for the four. Some time later, the group arrives at the entrance of the Dangaishu Temple and decides to invade the main entrance, just as they did last time. Then the fox separates from the group and exposes her neck so Jinka can take her blood to activate the transformation, taking the opportunity to say that if he manages to obtain Yezin's research and become Katawara as he desires, the two of them will be able to have a romantic relationship unlike just being siblings. Kama says that if he intends to conduct sadistic experiments like the leader of the Dangaishu, she herself will stop him. And with that, Shinka understands that if he uses another method, she will consider the matter. And so the boy ingests the fox of blood and activates the transformation while she thinks that her soul might be devoured before Jinka can transform into Katawara, but she shows interest in his proposal. Later, Jinka prepares to invade the temple and Shinsuke says he'll go with him, while Rinzu says she'll live for Master Tazen, and Tama will confront someone else. Meanwhile, Yezin continues talking to the woman who we discover is Kozunoha, Tama's mother. The man comments that the group has arrived and asks who her daughter's father is, showing jealousy of her past, and the fox says she'll tell him who the father is if Tama can find her. When the group reaches the main entrance of the temple, Doran was already waiting for them. The tiger explains that he is the only one they will have to face because the rest of the Dang issue deduced that the four would sneak into the temple, and so they went to protect other places, which is a good thing because it will allow him and Jinka to have a duel without interruptions. The boy starts attacking with his monarch's earthy fist, but the tiger uses brute force and punches him squarely in the face, making it clear that he will fight for real. Doran reveals that he has been learning Western techniques to be able to face Jinan, and with that, he learned a defensive maneuver called Wind Dodge, which makes him much more agile. Tama and Rinzu are worried about Jinka's safety, while Shinsuk analyzes the surroundings, looking for something. The fight continues, and Jinka keeps getting punched in the face until suddenly, Shinsuk wields his sword and hits Reshin squarely, who suddenly appeared on the scene. But then Shinsuke discovers that it's another one of the monks Shikigemis. The true body of Reshin appears, and he challenges Shinsuke to a duel. The swordsman accepts without hesitation, as that was the reason he wanted to go to the temple. So the two move away from the group to fight, and Tama tells Shinsuke that if he gets into trouble, he should shout loudly for Rinzu to summon him. Meanwhile, Yezin and Kuzunoha observe the situation from afar. Jika continues to face the tiger and summons his sixth tail to channel more spiritual power, However, the boy keeps getting beaten because he remains much slower than his opponent. Rinzu is worried about Doran's strength, while Tama continues to trust in Jinka's potential, considering that he is someone who has already survived several encounters with death. Kuzunova also notices the boy's potential, but Yezin says he is not enough to defeat a martial artist like Doran. And so, while the leader of the Dangi Shu trusts the tiger, Tama has faith that Jinka will be the winner. 
In the middle of the fight, Doran remembers that the first thing he thought when he became an enhanced human was his fear of becoming weak, because the power he obtained could very well have made him careless and arrogant. But that didn't happen because he found someone even stronger than him, whom he needs to overcome, Jinan, the Dragon Man. Furthermore, the tiger reflects that at that moment he is facing a monk with greater spiritual power than his own, so he can continue to improve his martial arts. Jika keeps taking a beating, unable to retaliate even once. He doesn't understand why as he had faced Durin before and was sure that now that he had evolved, he had enough power to win that fight, realizing at that moment that he underestimated his opponent who, like the dragon, is also far above him. Because of this, Jika awakens the miracle he needs to win, the technique of the soul of the five elements. Meanwhile, Shinsu tries to face Reshin but only manages to hit his Shikigemis, which leaves Arabuki tired of cutting only paper. He follows Reshin to the entrance of a cave where the monk challenges the swordsman to enter and Shinsuk doesn't hesitate to follow him. Shinsuk enters the cave in search of his opponent and goes straight until he reaches a building where he encounters another Dangashu who upon seeing him transforms into a creature, revealing to be another enhanced human and asks Shinsuk how dare he invade their laboratory. Shinsuk asks the monk to get out of his way, explaining that he is after a specific target. But before the Dangishu can respond, Reshin appears using a mega large and elaborate body to fight Shinsuk and strikes the monk from behind. And so Shinsuk and Reshin are excited that the time has finally come for them to duel. Back at the temple entrance, Jinka continues to take a beating from Doran until he uses the power of his fairy eyes to see his opponent's energy, thereby identifying the tiger's attacks in advance to dodge them. Suddenly, the arm that the boy lost in the battle against the dragon begins to shine, and a new arm of pure spiritual energy emerges, hitting the tiger squarely and sending him flying. Rinzu and Tama remember the seed that the mountain god has planted in Jinka's arm, and Doran laughs at having taken a beating, and says he will reward his opponent by showing another interesting trick he is still learning to use. And so the tiger begins to prepare his technique, which Jinka realizes consists of several sources of spiritual energy. At the same time, Reshin summons a technique just as powerful to hit Shinsuk, leaving the two boys worried about the attacks that are about to come. After Reshin attacks Shinsuk, causing a huge smoke cloud, he celebrates his victory, only to be surprised to realize that his opponent managed to escape the attack. The guy still manages to retaliate by landing another punch on Reshin, making it the fight where he took the most beating in his life. However, even though Shinsuk ends up ahead, his enchanted sword complains about him not using it instead of his fist. The swordsman realizes that Arabuki was right and grabs his sword to strike, but Reshin blocks it, making him realize he missed his chance to inflict damage on the opponent. So Shinsu backs off and says he'll find a hell for Reshin. The Dangishu gets excited and suggests they both look for a hell together. And so Shinsu runs with Reshin close behind. While he thinks that his opponent is right after all, both of them are filled with hatred and bitterness and even the Katawars he knows are more serene and human than the two. Back to the Jinka fight. Unlike Shinsuke, who managed to dodge the opponent's attack, the monk takes the tiger's blow head on and ends up knocked down, leaving Tama and Rinza worried. But even though he's injured, Jinka manages to stand up, which surprises Doran, because the technique he used on the boy distorts space-time, allowing him to deliver thousands of simultaneous blows in a second. Tama doesn't quite understand the tiger's explanation, and the mountain crow explains that the technique works as if he were summoning fists repeatedly. With the attack, Jinka feels dizzy and becomes confused about what was happening, unable to remember the tiger or his new arm made of spiritual energy. So he has the brilliant idea of literally sticking his hand into his head to poke around inside, trying to remember what was happening. Everyone doesn't understand what was going on, but with this, Jinka ends up modifying his brain and manages to awaken a new tail, this time being one of wind, bringing the guy to have a total of seven tails. Tama worries that her brother is taking on more than he can handle, unlike him who just gets excited about gaining more power. Doran also gets excited and admires his opponent's potential, who managed to gain three new tails in such a short time. So the two prepare to continue fighting and Jinka attacks with everything, striking the tiger at an absurd speed and with an attack resembling a spear, which makes him decide to call the new attack Spear of the Wind God. Doran acknowledges it as a powerful move but says it's too direct and therefore won't work a second time. So Jika prepares to unleash his ultimate technique, which is a combination of his five main techniques called Soul of the Five Elements, and uses his wind and lightning tails to surround the tiger, preventing him from escaping his energy bomb. Doran observes that it was an intelligent strategy from the boy, but says it won't matter. He begins to advance towards him as Jinka prepares to unleash his ultimate technique, when suddenly a group of hooded figures walks calmly right in the middle of the fight, completely ignoring the duel. 
The two are left baffled, and this group disappears as if they had never passed by. Then the tiger is hit by Jinka's energy bomb, but he doesn't care because he was focused on the hooded figures that passed by them. The guy asks if his sister saw the group, but neither she nor Rinzu saw anyone. Jinka continues to be confused about what had happened when Doran gets up and walks over to them. The guy prepares to fight, but his sister stops him, realizing that Doran no longer had intentions of fighting. The tiger says that Jinka has an unbelievable power and anyone else would have been reduced to ashes with that attack. So he surrenders, explaining that even though he's standing, his energy and spiritual power are completely drained and he's unable to continue fighting. Doran accepts his fate, but as much as Jinko wanted to finish off his opponent, Tama tells them to just move on. The tiger then asks if the guy enjoyed the fight. Jinka denies, explaining that it hurt like hell, but Doran says that unlike him, he had quite a bit of fun. Then the tiger collapses on the ground and the group leaves him there and continues on their way. Yezin, who is watching the fight from afar through a technique, becomes extremely worried to see that the only dang issue present capable of facing Jinka is defeated. So the leader of the monks decides to flee from the fight as there was no way to win anymore. And if he stayed, Jinka's group would discover about Kuzunoha after all, he didn't know that Tama and the others already knew about his relationship with the fox. Because of this, he decides it's time to use the Scorched Earth strategy, which basically involves destroying the entire temple and starting over from scratch, which also involves Tazen going into soldier mode and transforming into a giant fortress. Kozunova asks how Reshin will be, but Yezin says Dangeshu is just a bunch of junk he was gathering to throw away and not caring at all about the monk. Back to Reshin, he and Shinsuke arrive in a room and go for the second round of the fight. The Dangeshu throws several weapons at the swordsman, who dodges thanks to Arabuki's power to fly. The weapon chuckles as it realizes that for some reason, whether due to Shinsuke's lack of spiritual power or because he doesn't know how to handle a sword, its winds are not restricted with him, allowing it to fly freely. So Arabuki begins to fly, completely taking control of Shinsuke's movements while complaining about the tight space it's in. Reshin continues to try to hit his opponent and the sword has the idea of putting Shinsuke up high, causing the Dangeshu to hit the ceiling of the room and release an exit to the open air. Then Arabuki takes Shinsuke towards the sky and Reshin follows him through his equipment. The two start to duel while flying and Tama and the others spot them from below. Arabuki finds joy in being Shinsuke's wings and remarks that he's never felt so free. Then the weapon asks where his master wishes to go and he responds that he only wants to cut down his opponent. Arabuki considers that goal irrelevant when there's an endless horizon like that, devoid of hatred or vengeance, because strength and weakness mean nothing beneath a vast blue sky. Shinsuke is taken aback by receiving advice from his sword and by it finding his previous peace, as to him, it's nothing more than a personality he invented. Reshin questions why Shinsuke is talking to himself. Then the swordsman attacks, pondering what Arabuki said, managing to split Reshin's strange equipment in half and, in doing so, causing a huge explosion. The Dangishu around hear the noise and grow concerned, but Inga reassures them, saying it must have been just thunder. He even jokes it might have been Doran's belly rumbling. Then Ohau, realizing his partner was outdated, informs that the tiger was defeated and the laboratory destroyed, with Reshin likely not having survived. Inga reflects that this is the end of the main temple of the Dangeshu and how they were supposed to be order of monks combating monsters, and that those men before him are the only Dangeshu the world needs, but now they are paying the price for forgetting their purposes and becoming thirsty for power. Meanwhile, Reshin emerges from the wreckage of his equipment and attacks Shinsuke, causing the guy's sword to fly into a tree. The two, blinded by hatred, begin exchanging punches, but in a particularly strong beating that Shinsuke manages to deliver, his opponent literally starts to disintegrate like a true mummy, in a bizarre manner. Jika observes that the monk no longer has spiritual power to sustain the body of talismans and thus met his end. Then Shinsuke shouts as he realizes he finally managed to eliminate his enemy and avenge Shakugan. While the guy has his moment, Jinka notices that his witch sword gained spiritual power and became a Katawara, explaining how he could fight. Tama wonders what kind of creature Reshin was, one of the four beast leaders of the Dangeshu, but Shinsuke replies that he was just a nobody named Barry. Then he goes to Arabuki and remarks that when he and the Dangeshu were fighting, blinded by hate, his sword sought its ideal. Tama then tells Shinsuke that he can go home if he wants, now that he has avenged Shakovin, imagining that his friend is tired of that journey. However, the swordsman refuses and says that as long as the one responsible for the modified humans exists, he will continue being a demon. Tama understands his friend. Then after bidding farewell to Reshin, Shinsuke and his group head on. On the way, he calls Jinka, who responds to his name for the first time as he never took him seriously because of the hatred he feels towards humans. 
Then Shinsuk asks if he still wants to become a Katawara and says that as far as he knows, humans and Katawaras are the same. Jinka agrees, surprising the swordsman. He explains that they are the same inside, but the containers are different and that he has an idea of how to get this new container to fulfill his desire to become a Katawara. Tama scolds her brother and says that altering the brain with his spiritual hand as he did in the fight with Doran was very dangerous, and so it should not be repeated. After all, what happened to Reshin is what happens to those who seek unlimited power and she doesn't want that to happen to him. Suddenly, everything starts to shake and Rinzu sends the mountain crow to see what it is. Kojiro flies and comes face to face with Master Tazen. He warns the group and Rinza realizes that this is the moment to use her summoning power to call upon the mountain goddess. However, after using her ability, no one appears and Tazen stands right in front of them. Yezin and Kuzunoha were inside him and the leader of the Dangeshu gets excited for Jinka to feel the power of Tazen, while the fox, instead of worrying about the safety of her daughter, comments that if she didn't run away, she would become paced. With no way to face Tazen, the four run and Tama asks Rinzu if the mountain goddess is really coming. The girl explains that due to her mistress's size, she will take a while to cross the portal, but she assures that she will appear. Then Shinsu tells Rinzu to summon the goddess again, but she says that this might end up annoying her mistress. Next, out of nowhere, a gigantic mountain Katawara sprouts, larger than Master Tazen. Inside her, the goddess thanks her apprentice for inviting her and orders her mountain to march towards Tazen. Yazin and Kuzunoha become desperate with the situation and with just a kick from the giant mountain. Tazen falls to the ground defeated. The group of Dangeshu weep at the sight of the mountain while Inga reflects that it is futile to pursue power when there will always be someone more powerful. Then the goddess emerges from the mountain smiling for the victory and Rinzu and the crow celebrate to flatter their mistress. Inside Tazen, Yezin wakes up after fainting from the fall and the fox Yukai reveals her neck to her beloved to take his blood and activate transfiguration, just as Jinka does with Tama. And so the leader of the Dangishu emerges transformed and carrying Kuzunoha, who says she will be by his side wherever he goes. Then the two siblings fly away, while Shinsu takes Rinzu through his flying sword. At the same time, the mountain goddess is excited to deliver the punishment Yezin deserves and end that fight once and for all. Next week, we'll have more of this anime as soon as the new episode is released, so go ahead and subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to hit the like button below to support this video. See you guys.